Welcome everyone to Art and the Black Image. Thank you so much for being with us on this Saturday morning for us in the US and afternoon uh, other, at other places and very early on the West, on the West Coast and, and, and other places too. So again, my name is Zain Abdullah and we wanna begin by uh, uh, allowing Ellen McLarney, uh, who is the program director of the uh, Duke Islamic, uh, Islamic Studies Center at Duke University to uh, welcome us. So thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you so much, Zane. Uh, I just wanted to extend a warm welcome from the Duke Islamic Studies Center uh, to everyone to the to, to the symposium today, the art and the um, art, the art and the black Muslim image. Um, I would like to especially thank the Moreland Spring Arn Research Center at Howard University and the Muslim World Journal for helping make it make this possible. Uh, I'd like to especially thank uh, Professor Abdullah Zain Abdullah for his tireless efforts and commitments. Uh, my colleague, Professor Mbai Lowe, for his own recuperative work on Omar Ibn Sayyid, and Julie Maxwell for all the hard work she has put into organizing this. The events today were partly made possible by a Building Bridges grant from the Doris Duke Foundation in conjunction with the Duke Islamic Studies Center. Uh, in addition, this event is partly sponsored by the Reckoning with Race and Racism in the American South Initiative from the Provost Office at Duke. These projects seek to give an additional platform to the work of Muslim American writers, poets, and musicians of African descent. The aim is to deeply engage in a process of reckoning, consciousness raising, and reconciliation through the arts. In doing so, we hope to raise awareness about ongoing issues of anti-Black racism and anti-Muslim bias in the North Atlantic world. And we also strive to engage in a process of historical contextualization of the rich tradition of Islamic art and writing, and specifically the vibrant tradition of Black Muslim art in the United States. I also would like to dedicate today's panel, um, today's uh, symposium to all the victims of violence, um, but especially those recently killed by gun violence in both Buffalo and Uvalde. Thank you, Zane. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, so um, as you all have seen uh, in the advertisements and the like, that this is really a conversation. This is not just like an AAR uh, presentation meeting, very formal and that sort of thing. Uh, it's summertime for, I guess, most of us, and we, we want to enjoy uh, just engaging one another and being together. Um, we wanted to revisit this journal, uh, this special issue of the Muslim World Journal that was published summer 2020. Um, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about how it came about. Uh, it's interesting because I think, especially for graduate students and others, um, it gives us a sense of how long projects can take, but that's okay uh, because scholarship is a long journey. It's not a short, it's not a short sprint, it's a marathon. And oftentimes we get stressed out thinking that something has to be immediate. Um, but I think good work, like anything else, can marinate uh, and, and can build. And so uh, Timor uh, Yushkovyev, I'm sorry, 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 Timor, messed up your last name. Uh, uh, he actually approached me in 2013 about doing a, a special issue, being a guest editor for a special issue of the Muslim World Journal. And this was at an AAR meeting. Um, and I thought it was really intriguing because he suggested a, a special issue journal that focused on Islam in North America. Um, I told him I would think about it. I told him I was extremely excited about the idea and that I would get back to him. Now, actually that was 2013. I emailed him back March, 2019 six years later um, with um, a suggestion, right? And the suggestion was again to, un to uh, think more deeply about uh, Muslims of African descent uh, and, and what that meant at this juncture for us. Um, 
So with that, I proposed an idea uh, to do something around art, right? And these kind of images that would give us a different way of talking about uh, Black Muslims or Muslims of African, African descent. In other words, art for me would be a different in kind of engagement uh, because it would allow us to move beyond ideology. And I think that's really important. Oftentimes, I think we're, we get bombarded with, with, um, with, with terminologies and, 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 and ideological thinking, right? Or just a laundry list of what Islam is, what Islam is not, who are Muslims, who are outside of that pale, and that sort of thing. So I thought art would, would allow us uh, a different dimension um, a, a, to be able to embark upon new conversations and new ideas. So for me, art and culture uh, would allow hopefully us and, and our readers to feel the spirit of what we're talking about and not just read the, the kind of uh, turgid or dense uh, theories about what, what we think we're seeing. Um, I think the, the feeling is very important. The feeling is important for me uh, because when you think about it, um, a very small percentage of Muslims around the world of the 1.5 or more billion Muslims around the world, very, very small percentage read Arabic, right? You think about that, right? Um, the largest Muslim country, of course, is Indonesia, right? It's a South Asian country. Um, most Muslims do not live in the desert. You live more in maybe tropical areas or, right? But not in the desert, right? Um, and so what does that mean for how, what holds Muslims to this idea of Islam, right? It can't be the Arabic language, but there's something there in, in the beauty of it, the, art, the artistic nature of, the, of hearing the Quran, of sort of, sort of uh, uh, inhaling the words in terms of the way which the rhythm pulls at us, it pulls at our souls, right? And so for me, um, it's that art that we, we want to capture, that beauty, right? That we all are familiar with in terms of the hadith that, that Allah is, is, is beautiful and he loves beauty, right? And so that idea means that more people are attached to what they see as beautiful about Islam, right? And beautiful about being a Muslim in the world. Right, and sort of uh, embarking upon that mode of being a Muslim in the world, right? And so for me, it was all about how, we, how do we talk about that beauty? Uh, what is it in, in the art of it all that would give us new conversations, new ways of thinking about this thing? So um, with this, we, we again wanted to, to present an idea about the process of producing this kind of thing. Right, as as writers, as 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 editors, um, and those involved in other ways in the production of it, um, but also to kind of give us a way of of discussing our thoughts again. So this is not really about us kind of giving you a synopsis of our articles. We have a beautifully produced uh, special issue that you can read, right, and, and 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 ponder and all that. This is about maybe what did not end up in our articles, right? Um, what do we think about now? Wow, I mean, two years later, this is, this is something else, the way time is moving. But, but how, do we, how, do, how do we revisit these ideas? What have we thought about since then? Um, for me, and I'll sort of end here, but for me, um, one of the gifts of publishing is that you get the first joy of writing something and of sharing your ideas and your feelings with the world. The next gift that you get is when you get a chance to present it, right, at conferences or at universities or at churches or wherever, and anywhere in the public. But when you get a chance to talk about it again, you experience that gift all over again. And so I want to end here and bring on my colleague Timor to talk to you about the Muslim World Journal. But I wanna thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, being a part of this conversation and thank the panelists. I want to thank, of course, Duke University, Ellen, Julie, just everyone for, for making this possible. Thank you so much. Let's get started. Thank you, Zane. Um, and 
uh, let me just say this. Um, uh, until very recently, uh, my institution was called Hartford Seminary. Now we are uh, Hartford uh, University, Hartford International Univer University for Religion and Peace. But from the uh, time when we were a seminary, I still retain the habit of uh, beginning with uh, offering thanks. So um, let me just say this. I am thankful for coincidences. Um, there is something to coincidences. Uh, in, uh, and I, as, um, as the music was playing, as um, we heard the, the voice, um, it reminded me of Howard Thurman. <laughs> there is, um, for lack of a better word, there are some mystical vibes in there, right? Um, and, and Howard Thurman says, kind of, he kind of sneaks it in because it's too delicate to say bluntly. But in the beginning of his autobiography, he says, a coincidence, if there is such a thing. And so um, I think this particular issue, Zane, is one of those amazing coincidences. Um, one of the reasons why you don't know how to pronounce my first name, uh, my last name is because we, we have been on the first name basis since 1991. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, so let me just, just say a couple of things. Um, I think there is a there is a there is a big kind of question kind of that for us at the Muslim world kind of hovers around it, and it might be glanced at kind of you can get a feel of it by 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 looking at the cover of of Dr. Um, Jamil Aydin's book, the idea of the Muslim world. That cover is reminiscent of the cover of our journal. The very phrase, the Muslim world, is, um, is thorny. There are reality, I mean, that's just human realities, right? The, you cannot separate it from the histories that are thorny. And so um, as uh, when, when Zane and I met and have, we, we were talking many years ago, I was transitioning into a role of being co-editor of the Muslim World Journal together with Yahya Michel. And Yahya Michel, the previous editor, was exceedingly helpful in kind of guiding this process of gradual becoming of the journal into it's another way of being, right? And I think it's thanks to, to, to Yahya and, and, and Zayn, particularly Zayn, and, and the powers that are behind Coincidences that that this issue issue came came up, but let me just 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 say this. Uh, uh, the reason why I bring up brought up Howard Thurman is because of uh, Zane. How you put it in the introduction to the volume, you 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 work with um, Shahab Ahmed's book, and you 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 say that in a volume like this, a work like this questions our presumed certainties about where to find Islam, right? And throughout your introduction, and then through every piece in the volume, in the issue, we deal, the key word in there is humanity, the depth of the humanity, which reminds me of another thing that, that, that Thurman said in his sermon, um, because he was provocative. He said, there is no such thing as humanity. And then he clarified, what we call humanity has a name, was born, lives on a street, gets hungry, needs all particular things we need. As an abstract, it has no reality whatsoever. And so let me just say this, with this issue, what we are trying to communicate on behalf of the Muslim World Journal is, is what we mean by the Muslim world. And what we mean by it is quite simple. This is a journal about the world with Muslims in it. This issue uh, inaugurates kind of this more bold declaration of what we are. And Zane, thank you so much for this. And I really look forward to hearing from all the contributors and all the wonderful guests.
Nick. All right, I'll, I'll be very brief because I know I can see the time, but um, a, a few quick things about the journal. <clears throat> We're in our 112th year. So we have 112 volumes, 446 issues um, as of the latest one coming out. And um, I mean, uh, this issue that we're discussing today is, is very, very unique um, compared to what we usually have, which is um, here. And that we, we wanted to make sure the images were captured. We wanted to make sure everything was uh, printed in color which is something very unique. And so, I mean, the journal, if you look back on its history, and I won't, I won't take up too much more of y'all's time, but it began as a missionary endeavor um, with Duncan Black McDonald. And after 20 or so years, it then shifted to more of a, just a focus on um, just what is Islam. And this idea, again, going back to what um, both Timor and Zane have, have a focus on this idea of the Muslim world. What is the Muslim world? Um, and so in, in this 112 years of this journal, this uh, particular issue that we're discussing today, focusing on the art and not just the art, but um, the, the people behind the art, the, the identities, uh, what this represents, the humanization um, of these folks. It, it's, uh, it's particularly special and um, it, it really came at a difficult time at the start of the pandemic, and we worked our tails off to make sure that despite all of the, the, the roadblocks that came about very early on um, during the pandemic, that we, we still were able to produce what I think is, uh, I've been with the journal now for 12 years, and I think one of the, the proudest issues that, I mean, for me personally, that I was a part of, so. Um, I thank Zane, I thank uh, Timor um, for, and all the authors, all the contributors, uh, everyone who contributed to this issue for putting together such a wonderful, wonderful issue. Thank you. So the first session we have this morning is with Georgia Hazeldean and Richard Brent Turner. And I, I thank you both. Um, I think this is going to be a wonderful conversation uh, uh, about, um, yeah, you both wrote on something similar. And so um, I don't want to taint the waters. And I want you both to really have your time to, to have a conversation and, and lead us through this. So thank you both. Well, thank, thank you, Nick. And it's also brilliant to meet Richard. Um, here after we've exchanged emails um, what feels like many many years ago um, and also to see Zane and to be here with everyone else so yeah thank you for thank you for having me I'm really looking forward to talking about Eva Suleiman Diallo. Um, and it's good to finally meet you Georgia can can everyone hear me great and thank you to everyone for, for hosting this wonderful event. Certainly. Well, please begin. I mean, uh, um, Georgia, would you like to please go first? Yeah, of course. I mean, I guess um, I was sort of, I guess my sort of big question and, and sort of something that I'm, I'm really interested in is I think both Richard and I actually have approached um, William Hall's portrait of Diallo in quite a new in quite new ways um, because I think there's been a lot of problems and maybe this is something that we're, we're going to talk about um, today with what do we do with all these represent well not all these 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 kind of few very precious representations of black Muslims from the Atlantic world in the 18th and 19th century which were in fact made by white artists. And there's this very few select number of these portraits and they're really exciting. And we can kind of talk about their agency and their, um, their power of representation. But I think also we're gonna keep coming up against this issue of we're seeing it through the white gaze. This is, the, this is a kind of, um, uh, these portraits don't have 
they're not self-representation, perhaps. And I think Richard and I, in our articles, both have tried to kind of really wrestle with that idea and have brought in different theorists and different thinkers and different approaches to try and understand what we can still get from these portraits and where we have to be a bit skeptical. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I wonder if this is something that um, Richard might be a good place for us to start to sort of talk about. Um, would that, does that feel comfortable to you? Yes, it does, because, um, you know, I'm reading your article again yesterday. I, I see how our, uh, our theoretical approaches um, kind of intersect with one another, because you um, use W.E.B. Du Bois's um, concept of double consciousness, mm -hmm. and I have used um, Charles H. Long's concept of signification, the issue of mm -hmm. naming and identity in the uh, modern world for, you know, for people who've been marginalized by colonialism and enslavement and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, where do the power sources um, emanate for, um, you know, for these issues of identity construction, particularly mm -hmm. during um, the era of enslavement. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, I think both of us have found some really interesting places where we can we can sort of trace some of Diallo's self forming as well, and where we get a taste of who he might have been, with a kind of scepticism as well of like often this is being filtered through his biographers, but there is some fantastic writings, and I mean maybe um, I realised that perhaps maybe we should start with just giving a bit of introduction about who Abe Suleiman Diallo is. I'm conscious that Richard and I know lots about him, but perhaps maybe that would just give us a bit of a framework. Um, Please do. I mean, just, yeah, yeah a, a brief introduction to his life and, and I mean, how he came about, like, the story is quite fascinating. So please, that would be, I think, very helpful. Thank you. And Georgia, I'll let you do that. Begin, at least <laughs> begin. Begin it. So I'm going to make sure I've got all my dates right because I think this is actually quite important. Um, so I think, I mean, Diallo is, is a fascinating figure um, because he's, uh, and I think this makes him quite remarkable because he crosses the whole of the Black Atlantic. You know, he starts off um, in Xenogambia um, and he's part of a wealthy, very learned family. Um, and he is also part of the slave trade in the sense that he is someone who owns slaves. And it's actually at the moment where he is going on behalf of his father to sell two slaves that he himself is captured. Um, and he is then forcibly enslaved, taken to Maryland, and is the, and is at that point, manages to continue his Muslim identity in a condition of enslavement. And we, we learn from his later biographies how he is um, working on plantations, but he is taking him, himself off to pray five times a day. We know that he's sustaining his beliefs and trying to dress modestly. And you know, this is something that Richard, I think, talks about really wonderfully in his article about his kind of like holding on to these signifiers um, despite the conditions of enslavement. After a couple of years, he runs away. Sorry, Nick. No, I, I mean, um, we've had a few folks ask, can, can we put up an image? Do you mind sharing an image? Uh, some of the, Im the images of who we're speaking of um, for those who yeah, haven't seen the issue, yes. Um, shall I um, share my screen? Would that be Please easiest? Do. I've got a couple of images, Richard. Please do. Um, and we, we can continue the conversation with that up, so please do. Great. Um, Great, I'll share this and then here we are. Um, you can, this means I'm, I'm not gonna be able to see you as, as well, um, Richard, but does that look clear to you? Have we got him on the screen? Yes. Great. Um, so I think just to kind of, yes, yeah, so in this very potted history of his life, um, whilst he's in Maryland, he escapes um, and is then captured again in a nearby town. And this is the moment where he meets his future biographer, 
a man called Thomas Blewett. Um, and I think for me, I'm, I'm very interested in the way that this, this interaction happens um, because it's because of his, um, his great learning and his ability to recite sections of the Quran that Blewett takes him seriously as in what Blewett terms as an African gentleman. Um, and I think that's something we can kind of hold on to there as a, as a one of these reasons why I think Richard and I have been very interested in um, using Long or Du Bois as theorists to kind of open up this kind of this complex identity of this man, um, this man Diallo. Um, there follows a few a few months where he is um, he's in fact returned to the the person who had uh, who had enslaved him. Um, but when he's there, he sends an email, he sends, sends an email, sends a letter, sorry, that was a very 21st century moment. Um, um, he, sends, um, he sends a letter um, to his father, in, which is written in Arabic, and it has a whole um, list of um, messages to the people that, um, um, to people back home, um, and referring to them and talking about them in very eloquent terms, I think, about um, his relationships to each of them and sending them wishes and, and telling them about the land of the Christians in which he's in. Um, and this letter is intercepted in Britain by um, a man called Oglethorpe, who was part of the Royal African Company. Um, and on reading this letter, this man seems to realise that this is in fact someone who there's a petition or a reason for um, bringing over to Britain, not necessarily freeing, but is is purchased um, by the Royal African Company from the person who's enslaved him in Maryland, and he travels on the Royal African Company ship over to um, over to Britain. And when he's there, he's in Britain for two years, and he, because of his learning, because of his amazing um, Islamic knowledge and his knowledge of Arabic, he makes a lot of very influential friends. Um, he even meets the royal family of Britain, and he is taken up by um, kind of the great scholars of the day, like someone like Hans Sloan, who, where he's translating parts of the Quran for him. And in this process, and it's a bit unclear what the dates are in the 1730s around exactly when he is, um, gains his manumission, but there is a fundraising campaign between all these friends who then buy his freedom for him. And it's at this moment that this portrait by um, a kind of young and up and coming portrait artist called William Hoare is painted. Um, and this is the, the kind of the, the, the main artifact that Richard and I have been um, thinking about is this moment where we're not sure exactly of the precise dating of when the portrait is made, but it's at some point between um, the kind of around, well, around 1735. We're not sure if it was when he was um, before or after his manumission. And I think this becomes quite an interesting point when we're thinking about his agency within this process. Georgia, may, may I ask yeah. you to click on the slideshow so we can see the full screen? And then if you wanna go through some of the images Ooh. you have, that would be fantastic for us. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Fantastic. So here is, um, here is the portrait um, of Diallo. Um, and I mean, Richard, do you want to, would, you, would this be a good moment just to chime in to, well, I guess just to finish his story very quickly. We have Diallo then is, um, manages to return home. Um, and he returns home a free man, um, but one who continues to work for several years in the rubber trade with the Royal African Company. Um, so this is his kind of remarkable story. And it is, it is truly remarkable that, that he's managed to sort of through his own, this is I mean, what I think is so powerful about his, his through his own self-advocacy, his own storytelling is able to um, get tons of different people on side um, to help him achieve the remarkable, which is to end up back home in Bundu in Senegambia. Um, but to dwell on this portrait, which was the kind of the locus of, of, our, of our discussions, um, I mean, Richard, I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about um, about his dress and why it looks like this, because um, I think you talk about that so beautifully in your article. Well, I think that um, this portrait kind of unwittingly uh, 
it, it was not meant to do this, opens up a, 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 in the uh, 18th century, a broad discussion about enslaved people of African descent as human beings. Because in this portrait, we, um, you know, we see all the signs of a, of a uh, brilliant human being who, uh, you know, who is a, is a scholar. Uh, he is a, he is a uh, Muslim with um, values of, um, complex values of, um, of, of practicing a, uh, a very important religion in the world. He is dressed modestly and, um, and all of this cuts against the grain of what it um, would mean to be an enslaved person of African descent in the United States. Because in the United States, we do have to keep in mind that um, the most brutal form of slavery that's ever existed in the world is codified according to laws, particularly, you know, um, um, a bit after the death of um, of Ayuba, of Ayuba Suma Diallo in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution of the United States in which um, enslaved people in this country, really all Black people in this country are defined as non-human beings. So this portrait, um, you know, cuts against the grain of those um, anti-human rights values that are um, very deeply a part of um, how the United States of America um, is um, going to emerge as a, as a country, um, as a major democracy in the world, but also with this paradox that it's a, you know, it's a, a major democracy in the world and it has the, uh, you know, the most brutal form of enslavement going on in the world, which um, you know kind of finances the economic infrastructure of capitalism, and um, so this portrait um, speaks to a, uh, to a lot of larger issues. And you know, in my mind, although it was not meant to do that, it speaks to the um, you know the the differing um, attitudes towards um, transatlantic slavery in the United States and in Great Britain, because um, you know in the um, early 1800s, um, of course, slavery is going to be abolished in Great Britain much earlier than it was abolished in the United in the United States, and. Um, and uh, to me, this portrait speaks to mythologies about democracy in the in the U.S., where um, you know some some people in um, contemporary United States uh, interpret this portrait as a you know as a sign that the United States was um, you know headed towards uh, democracy and you know eventually was headed towards abolishing um, anti-black racism and, um, and, and, and slavery. But actually, um, that's where, not where the US was, was headed in the 1700s or, or, or the 1800s. Um, a couple of final larger issues. Um, the portrait, uh, you know, kind of speaks to Pan-Africanism Although I don't, I, I don't believe that Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, um, you know, saw himself as a, or or William Hoare as a um, one of the early represent representatives of Pan Africanism. This idea that the liberation struggles of people of African descent in the modern world are all linked to one another, both in Africa and uh, Europe and and in the Americas. And the final thing is that I believe that uh, uh, this portrait, although it was not meant to do this, speaks to um, ongoing 
human rights struggles um, in the in the United in the United States, because um, we have to keep in mind that um, you know human rights of um, people of African descent in the United States is still is still an issue that has not that has not been re, has not been resolved. Um, in the twenty in the twenty first century, in spite of a in spite of a civil rights movement that um, you know that um, you know has provided um, so called legal protections for um, you know for rights of of Americans, but um, to me the the larger issue of this portrait is one of human is one of human rights that. Um, you know, we see this person, he's appealing to us as a, as a human being, as a person who does not want to be an enslaved person. And, um, you know, the horror of, of enslavement of people of African descent in the modern world is, um, is still raging um, in, the, in the 1700s. But, but also um, kind of going off the, you know, the, the chart a, a little bit. Um, I, I just want to read a very brief paragraph about um, about human rights and and, and and slavery that has come from the uh, United Nations Human Rights High Commissioner, who is still investigating um, human rights of um, of um, of national ethnic religious, racial, and linguistic minorities in the United States. And he came to the United States in November 2021, still investigating um, these, these, these issues. And, um, you know, his report that kind of resonates with some of the human rights values of this, of this portrait is that the United States and mind you, he's writing in 2021, is a nation of paradoxes when it comes to human rights and minorities, espousing itself as a land which welcomes the world's tired, poor, and huddled masses, um, people of European descent, yet where support for slavery led to one of the world's most brutal civil wars in the 1860s, where racial segregation persisted late into the 20th century, and where indigenous peoples' experiences have for centuries been one of dispossession, brutality, and even genocide. So I think that um, William Hoare and uh, Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, um, you know, very unwittingly um, um, did not understand the significance of, 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 of this portrait to encompass and express larger values about um, the human rights of people of African descent in the modern in the modern uh, world, but um, and the final thing is that I, I guess we'll never know this, but I've been very fascinated to think as to whether um, Ayoba Suman Diallo's own human rights values were transformed by his experience, his horrific experience as a slave in, um, in, in the colonial, uh, colonial America, as well as for a short time, a slave in America, because of course, he was participating in uh, you know, enslavement of Africans in, in, West, in West Africa, which is also a human rights crime. Um, Different, it's a different kind of enslavement, of course. It doesn't um, rise to the, the um, you know, the, the horrific level of transatlantic slavery, where you know people's human status are is uh, denied um, by law because of race. But that's a you know that's a larger question that I kind of um, uh, you know think about over and over again in my mind when I reflect on on this portrait. Mm. Oh, Richard, so fascinating. Um, I've made loads of notes. I'm <laughs> wondering okay. what to, to pick up on. Um, I mean, it's, it's just wonderful to hear how you, um, yeah, how you've, you've sort of, 
yeah, how we can really situate this portrait and its importance within our contemporary world and why it's so important that we're looking at it and that we keep looking at it and we show it to as many people as we can because I think it's still a relatively unknown portrait like I'd be I mean I'd be really interested um to know how many people on this call perhaps who'd not you know not looked at the um you know Zane's wonderful journal um if they'd seen this before you know or if they if they knew about it because I, I think it's quite um I think it is remarkable and I think it has, as Richard says, so many layers and things that we can kind of pull at it. Um, I guess there was one thing I just wanted to bring in was, was a bit of Diallo's voice as well, that we have 13 letters of his, which sounds tiny, but also is kind of wonderful that we do have some of his voice. Um, and, and I think it's just, um, I want to read this quote out because I think it really resonates with what Richard was just quoting from this contemporary um, kind of study of human rights in, 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 in um, the US today. Um, and so this is him writing, writing home um, with a message to each of his family. And he addresses a message to his two wives, um, to Finda Sadiq Bass and to Umbibu um, Bukaita um, and to his children. Um, Samba the Bene Ayuba, Dimba Ayuba, and Fatimata Ayuba. Um, and, he, and he addresses this message and he says, To all the Muslims, male and female, in the country of Bundu, it is Ayuba B. Suleiman, on the way to the country of the Christians. There is no good in the country of Christians for a Muslim. I mean, can't get more damning for his, um, his indictment of what he sees in the US. Um, and I think this completely affirms with what Richard is saying about that this is a voice from, you know, 300 years ago that is reminding us and, and insisting on the brutality of the system that he is seeing and what he is, what he is a witness to. Um, I guess this is partly, you know, just to kind of follow on from Richard, sort of thinking about how we're reflecting on, on the portrait. And this is me revealing my kind of art historical Ben, as a, as a portrait specialist, um, I thought maybe we could just talk a little bit about what we see in the portrait and why we see this kind of like really, um, why it seems so remarkable. Um, because I think that what we are witnessing when we look at this um, and why we can read so much into it still is partly because William Hoare has created a remarkable likeness. It is a fantastically detailed and sensitive portrait. Um, and one that contains within it so many different little codes um, that are a mark of the fact that Diallo is insisting on his own self-representation as a black Muslim from the west coast of Africa. Um, so what he wouldn't have been wearing these clothes in London, I guess just, you know, this is not how he was dressed when he sat for his portrait. He, in fact, had to describe this to uh, to the painter and his future biographer and friend Thomas Blewett was in the room when he did this um, and so we'll imagine there was there was this man this learned Muslim man in Britain dressed in in western clothing um, who then had to talk through and describe exactly how he wanted to be portrayed um, down to the the turban he was wearing um, you know the 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 Quran round his neck, which we believe is one of three that he wrote himself um, from memory. Um, and that also, you know, he's, his, if you look very closely at this portrait, and I hope that your screen, screen resolution is good enough, but it's actually very, very visible when you see this portrait um, um, in person, is that you do also have the prayer mark on the center of his head as well. Um, and that there's these kind of notices that we see in it, which shows that not only do we have something that to our modern eyes reads as an almost, um, you know, not quite photo realist, but, you know, very close to that portrait where we can see his particularity and his, um, you know, the sort of the beautiful modeling of his face and the sensitivity of his mouth and those really bright, intelligent eyes that mean that if you kind of cut out everything else and just looked at that bit, you could say, oh, is that my friend? You know, is that someone that I, that I know that I've met before? Um, but then on top of that, we have all these layers of how he is telling his own story and representing his own identity as a black Muslim from West Africa, who has, through this 
you know, this horrific journey has ended up in Britain for two years. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, sort of wondering where we should turn to next. I mean, Richard or Nick, do you have anything that you'd like us to kind of move on to, or I can keep just kind of showing you some pictures and things as well? Um, well, I, I think that the details of this um, portrait that you so brilliantly um, uh, articulated for us, Georgia, speak to this larger theme of, of enslaved West African Muslims as, as the leaders of intellectual resistance to enslavement. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, we do know from uh, a lot of scholarship now that, um, you know, enslaved Muslims in the Americas had a great advantage to uh, intellectually resist enslavement because uh, a number of them, um, you know, were uh, scholars. They were literate in Arabic, which is a language that, um, you know, very few people in the, uh, in the United States were literate in, in the 1700s. And we do know that they, that they had, in, um, you know, uh, kind of, um, uh, transnational networks with one another uh, across different colonies and countries in the Americas that they were uh, uh, writing uh, letters to one another. We, we still don't know how, how this happened. We know that Umar Ibn Said, um, who will be discussed later, was even uh, corresponding with a Muslim in China. <laughs> and we don't know how all, all of how all of this happened, but this speaks to um, you know the power of this theme of intellectual resistance to enslavement, and um, and, and and this portrait um, just very very um, brilliantly represents that very that very very important thing. I wonder if um, I'm just going to scan through a couple of pictures. Um... Just to get to, or try to anyway, apologies. Um, um, this, which is, has recently been acquired um, um, by the, um, by a kind of an art center in, in Beirut, which is believed to be one of Diallo's handwritten Qurans. Um, of the three that, you know, I said that it was three that he had written um, and that this was seen by people in Britain as exactly as Richard says, this amazing kind of feat of intellectual kind of ability that he was able to write, write this whole text out. Um, and then I find it also fascinating that then someone has gone and bought a, this representation of him by the artist William Hall um, which has then been turned into an engraving um, and then has pasted that into this same book as well. So that you then get this kind of composite of these kind of forms of representation. You get Diallo, this moment of demonstration, this, you know, I mean, how long would it have taken him to write this? Um, um, I'm not sure, but, you know, maybe we've got like a day of his labor in his handwriting here, um, which was this amazing kind of moment of, of intellectual resistance and also kind of this was his calling card this was how he got his freedom was by being so clever and so interested um, and then it's then been spliced with his image in this way um, and I think it's absolutely incredible that this um, that this Quran has come to light and that and that it's now in the world and people can go and look at it if you if you can get to Lebanon but um, that is yeah I just think it's such an exciting artifact of, of his of his time and you know and perhaps as Richard says this is something that we can point to as as part of this much bigger story um, um, an untold relatively untold story of the kind of intellectual resistance of of enslaved black Muslims. Um, Dr. Hazeldeen um, yeah. real quick um, based off of this we've had a few questions and, and for those right. of you who are putting questions into the chat I, I'm doing my best to save them but I think this is kind of related to what you were just saying. Um, there was a question um, from Elizabeth Brown on the decision to portray Diallo and the close of his native country. Did yeah. Diallo address this decision in his letters? Uh, that is, what is the evidence 
that it was uh, his decision to insist that this was what he wanted to be represented in. So the only evidence we have um, in relation to what happened on that day when he was sitting for his portrait um, is because his friend Thomas Blewett, who was the man who you might remember I said had, um, um, had first found him in Maryland um, and identified him as, as this incredibly bright and bright figure who was because of this was seen to justify, uh, he was seen to be then classed as wrongfully enslaved compared to many people that presumably blew it and others who certainly weren't abolitionists thought had been somehow rightfully enslaved. I think that's just important to caveat there. Um, Blewett was his good friend and he was the person who took him to and persuaded him to sit for his portrait. Um, and there's a kind of a page in the life of um, the life of Diallo that um, Blewett writes um, that describes the scene of the of not only his friends having persuaded him to sit, but then um, they call it. There's apparently it was like very smart repartee between Hor and Diallo. So they're going back and forth and they're and they're um, sort of testing each other. Um, and so as is as most um, sort of trained portraitists at the time would do. Paul has begun by painting his face. So he will have sort of begun from the nose out. That's what um, Godfrey Neller um, um, taught. And that's definitely who Hall was following. So he's begun with the nose and the eyes and he's sort of begun the, the face um, area. And then they start talking about how, what he should be represented in, what his clothing should be. Um, and it's at that moment that we, that Blewett's recorded. And obviously we can't, we don't know how accurately he was doing the transcription. Perhaps it's not as good as Zoom's, um, but you know we hope he's kind of caught some of his um, sort caught some of that dialogue. Um, but he is um, there's this kind of exchange where um, where Hall says, "Well, I can't I can't possibly draw you in this costume um, because I've never seen it. I don't know what your national dress looks like." And and to the to that Diallo responds, "Well, you know." You Christians, you're you're often trying to represent Jesus Christ and and God, and you don't seem to bother. You know, it doesn't bother you that that's happening. Um, so therefore, you know, surely you're not a very good artist um, if you can't understand what my national dress is by the description. And so, I guess that's where I feel that's the evidence that then this must have been pretty detailed what he went into, um, because we've got this portrait that feels very credible. You know, it feels like credible credible dress. And I think Richard um, in his article. Um, brings in some wonderful sources to talk about what those kind of that historic costume looked like as well. So I, you know, I really encourage you to read that in detail if that's one of the bits that you're fascinated in, um, because it's, um, yeah, that's where we've got the evidence for is from Blewett. Thank you. And, and, and Dr. Turner, I mean, there was a, just a recent question, and I, I promise to try to get back to the, the previous ones, but from uh, Carl Johnson, um, can you see the question or would you like me to, to, to read it for you? Read it for me, please. Okay. okay, sir. Do you think that Diallo's view was influenced any by the um, Suwarian tradition of Islam and or the Sufi tradition in Islam that tended to make so-called slavery in West Africa before the 1700s much less harsh than chattel slavery, um, even medieval suffragette in Europe? Um, surfordom, forgive me. Uh, I understand that semantics always play a part in these discussions. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure if I if I have um, any source materials to answer this question um, this question properly, but certainly we we do have to emphasize that um, you know slavery in Africa was not um, the same as slavery in the United States. Your human status as a, <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a slave, particularly in Muslim communities was not taken away from you by law. And mm -hmm. certainly you were not um, transported across a, a vast ocean to another, to another part of the world from which you had very little chance of, um, you know, Returning, returning home. So they they certainly are two different um, uh, forms of, um, of of slavery in the um, in the modern in the modern world. And uh, perhaps to answer um, 
this question, I, I recommend uh, reading Paul Lovejoy's book or some parts of it, Transformations of, 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 of Slavery. It's just a brilliant book that I've, I've been reading for 30, for, you know, for about 20 years to, uh, you know, to see these um, important differences between uh, uh, the different, um, you know, institutions of, of, of slavery in the, um, in the modern world. But also to, um, to make one um, very brief comment to the last question, I think that uh, this conversation that went on between Diallo and Hor points to the courage of Diallo to even um, begin to entertain such a conversation because he had to have known that his, um, his freedom could have been revoked at any point in, in time, even in Great Britain, and that he could have ended up in a you know, very, very horrible situation, uh, enslaved for the rest of his, his life. Uh, so um, it, um, I, I think that that, that, does, that does need to be pointed out. And also, um, I, um, um, and this is something that Georgia, you may be able to speak to more effectively as, a, as an art historian, the kinds of uh, artistic and humanistic values that Hoare uh, himself had to, um, you know, to create this, this kind of, of portrait in, um, in Britain at a, at a time when um, slavery had not been abolished. Yeah, Dr. I mean, oh, sorry, please, sorry. Georgia, please. No, I was just, I was just gonna leap in there because I think what Richard's saying is fascinating. And I think, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, when Zane said at the, the beginning, what have you been thinking about over the past two years? And I was like, oh gosh, what have I been, what have I been thinking about <laughs> in relation to this? Um, but I guess, yeah, just as a kind of counterpoint to looking at Diallo, who's obviously, in some ways, we can have this incredibly positive kind of story about his, his, his self-portrayal. Um, I've actually spent a, a lot of the past couple of years um, working with the artist the Astor Gates at the, the Victoria and Albert Museum. And one of the big things we've been researching are, are, are kind of racist depictions of people from the African diaspora um, in ceramics. And within decorative arts more generally. And I've you know, had the pleasure of working with um, wonderful scholars like Adrian Childs to kind of understand this more. Um, and I think it's, it's only when you start to look at those images that you start to see how remarkable Hoare was and how courageous Diallo was that they managed to make this portrait together because surrounding them was a, a really established visual identity of the, of the enslaved person and also a romanticized, um, exoticized, orientalized representation of black Africans at that time. Um, and this is, you know, this is being reiterated in, 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 high, paint, in high paintings and all the way down to, um, you know, kind of like scrappy satirical drawings. Um, and I think that's why I feel like this is so remarkable because it's in, it's in a context and a visual culture that would not, would not countenance something as um, deeply personal and specific as this portrait of Diallo. Um, and I think, you know, just to Zane's wonderful introductory essay in, in, the, um, in the journal, he points to that fantastic quote from Fred, Frederick Douglass about the inability of the white artist to be able to represent the black, a black person because of the huge number of racial stereotypes that that white artist has seen over and over again, and that they're therefore exaggerating and changing the features of the person um, whenever they try and portray them or depict them. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, I thought that was such a wonderful way to kickstart this journal of just uh, opening that problem um, um, so thank you, Zane, for, for sharing that with us in the journal. But yeah, sorry, Richard, I just... No, no, no. In, in, if I can, to, to follow up on that, um, um, you're speaking of your, your current research. Um, there was a, a great question where um, uh, the participant brought up the, that this painting is currently in the natural, uh, National Portrait Gallery in London. 
but as property of Qatar Museum's authority. And this person has read about the wrangling and wondering if this can be considered as part of the larger, long kind of struggle over property and representation. Um, uh, for that person, I, I, I apologize. I, I, I have to go back for the name, but um, could, could you perhaps say anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a this is a point of I think of, of in some ways great great sadness to me. So I, I spent the first nine years of my career working at the National Portrait Gallery um, and working on part of the campaign to try and acquire the Allies portrait. Um, and the long and short of it is we didn't get enough money um, after doing a big public campaign. We were supported by lots of different people. We raised as much money as we could and we couldn't afford it. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it was very, it was a, yeah, a very sad moment that when it came to light, you know, this, was a, this portrait was lost, you know, no one knew where it was. And then it got turned up by an art dealer in the late 2000s. Um, and at that point, it obviously became obvious this was going to be a really big deal and that loads of institutions would want it. Um, and so despite having all sorts of amazing cultural figures like um, um, Ben Ockrey and Gus Casey Hayford, um, we, behind it, as well as a huge fundraising bid, we weren't able to buy it. But the Qatar authorities have got it on a long-term loan um, to the National Portrait Gallery because they believe that it is the best place for it to be seen, that it stays in Britain as part of a kind of important um, insistence that are, you know, that, that for the National Portrait Gallery, then, you know, the, the one institution in the UK that is tasked with trying to represent the, the people of Britain, that we need to have Diallo there as, a, as an indicator of this kind of an early black, Muslim figure who came to such prominence and had such a big effect, not only in the sort of few years around his life, but persisting through the abolition movements. And I think now as, as, a, as a figurehead and a touchstone for you know, people across Britain who can start to see someone who looks like them or believes like them um, in, in their big national institution. So, so yeah, I think that's, that's sort of where, where we are with it. Can I ask you to un, um, unshare your screen? Maybe we can go back to the, the larger view. And we only have maybe four minutes left, but if, if uh, folks, um, if there's some other questions, if you could uh, um, virtually via Zoom <laughs> raise your hand, um, there is um, an option to do so. It would be great to hear some voices to, to ask some questions in the, in the final few minutes. if my colleagues can help me if, if there's a hand raised that I'm not able to find. Uh, yeah, Nick, uh, Miriam Sharif has a hand raised. Okay, please. And, and, and Elizabeth uh, Brown. Oh, there we go. I, I'm just not seeing them. Yes. Miriam, please. Mary, you're on, you're on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear now, yes. Wonderful. Thanks so much for this wonderful program. I had a question earlier for Dr. Turner to please repeat the name of the resource and author of the, um, when he was discussing Black identity that he referenced in the very beginning, especially as it pertains to Muslims in Africanism and um, how uh, African Muslim identity is portrayed. Um, are, are you on? Um thinking about the um, Paul Lovejoy book, Transformations in Slavery, A History of Slavery in Africa. Or perhaps the Charles Long book? Oh, Charles, Charles yeah, Long. The Charles point. Long book is Significations. Thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. Yeah. And, and Dr. Turner, real quick, I mean, and how, how did that book play into the writing of your article at all? I mean, what was there any, not how did it play, but obviously it did. 
any particular points where that influenced uh, your article um, significantly? Well, you know, it, um, it, the, the um, Charles Long's work greatly influenced my first book, Islam in the African American Experience, where <clears throat> I argue in the book that um, this issue of <clears throat> naming and identity and uh, who controls um, you know, the names of, of, uh, of people of Muslim descent and their identities is a, is a major theme in, uh, you know, in the uh, history of African-American Muslims from um, in the Americas from 1492 to the, to the present, to the present time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, to me, it's always been a very, very useful theory to look at how um, you know there's a, a, a you know a public transcript of um, of identity and naming that of course is controlled hegemonically by um, the state, but at the same time there are all these different kinds of intellectual resistance to enslavement and uh, subaltern strategies that um, marginalized um, people, particularly Muslims, are engaging in, in the United States and, and in the Western world. And the final thing that I'd like to throw out there is that this portrait, um, as well as Diallo's writing, shows us how intertwined anti-Black racism and Islamophobia are in the modern Western world because he's making some very um, you know blatant um, courageous statements about um, the United States or colonial America mm -hmm. as a Christian country for which there's nothing good for Muslims in the modern world yeah so so, so, so Nick I don't know so Elizabeth Brown has a question before we end this session yes I mean thank you thank you Zane Thank, thank you. I know I already um, asked a question and it will be really brief. Thank you for this really beautiful um, conversation. And I, I was just wondering if we could briefly go back to, I think the great point, Dr. Hazeldine, that you made about that, um, your opinion that this painting of Diallo is pretty much not taught, I, I'm assuming in art history classes. And and I, I think if any you know art historian, art professor could, just see this talk, it, you, you both have made such um, eloquent points as to why it should be very much taught. Um, so I was just wondering, and I don't know if this is a quite fair question, but um, to your, in your perspective, why this painting is not part of the canon, if you will, of, you know, kind of the survey or kind of like any type of art historical uh, class of this moment in the uh, 18th century painting. Thank you. I mean, I, I think just to, from my experience in, in teaching in universities in the UK, I think it's that there's a huge amount of work to be done to, to start to let any kind of new, um, I guess just yet yeah, more diverse representations of people into the curriculum. Um, I think, you know, I've been t teaching 18th and 19th century um, art history for quite a long time and it is remarkable how I constantly find colleagues who've not really taught anything beyond you know Blake and Turner and Reynolds and um and in that context aren't looking at these figures who perhaps don't fit into their very neat ideas around what Georgian England looked like um and I think that that's the tricky thing with this portrait about Diallo is he doesn't fit in so if you're doing a big story about about him. I think, you know, my attempt in the article that I, I put forward to the Muslim Journal in, in some ways was to try and situate him within representations of polite masculinity. And that's one, one way that I, I've taught him so that you then get him in amongst representations of all these other powerful figures um, within the history of portraiture. But I completely agree with you, Elizabeth. I think he needs to be talked about a lot more and, and spoken about, um, Richard. Um, what's, what's your thoughts? Um, well, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 
scholar of religious studies and African-American studies and a historian, so I'm not um, well-versed in, in art history as you so brilliantly are. But in response to your question, I will just talk to my younger sister who is an art history major at Wellesley College. Of course, she's an African-American woman and um, you know, she was a college student in the late 1970s. Uh, and um, she basically said that art history at Wellesley College resonated with, a, unfortunately, with a film that we can see called Mona Lisa Smile. <laughs> you know? that, that, that was basically a representation of what, you know, Wellesley College, uh, this very elite college for very uh, intelligent and wealthy white women uh, were doing with the art history major in the 1950s. And mm. um, basically, you know, my sister's um, reflections on what she learned is that it was, you know, the, the art history major um, was completely about European art. Mm. It, was a, it was a great major for, you know, to focus on European and Euro-American art, but there was nothing spoken about with reference to, you know, the, the art of people of African descent in the modern world. Thank you. I, Sorry, I, just I, one, I, oh, okay. can one I just last do one story. very quick thing, Nick? Very um, quick. Um, I just wanted to, I'm just going to mm -hmm. quickly share my screen again, because I think one point I just wanted to make, which I think follows on from what Richard was saying, was that I think one of the most important ways I think we should be teaching about portraits like Diallo's um, is through the kind of contemporary lens of, of artists who are currently working on interrogating portraiture and thinking about it in different ways. And I thought I'd just share the work of two, of two artists, um, perhaps Rosa Johanna Odeo, probably less familiar to anyone there. She's only in her early twenties. Um, she's a really up and coming artist in Britain at the moment. And she's done an amazing um, exhibition all about recovering the images of Balthazar. Um, and trying to think about who was this one black person who was allowed into all these white European paintings that Richard was, Richard was describing. Um, fantastic. I really recommend looking at her work. She's so bright. Um, but then also Ingrid Pollard is, um, you know, she's been working since the 70s in Britain, reimagining portraiture. And I think there's no better way to think about what the meanings of representation are in portraiture than like getting stuck into her work. So I think if you are anyone who's teaching the visual world, going through that contemporary lens can, can really you, help. Can, so I will can I'll you stop put her? Sharing. No, no, please, but can yeah. you put the names in the uh, the chat for those who um, are who may be wondering? And we do need to take a, take a break. Um, okay. I know some folks would love uh, uh, just a, a quick chance. I, I greatly appreciate both of you in your conversation. I, I hate to be the person who has to, to close this uh, time together, but um, we are very indebted to um, your articles and to this conversation. So um, I would like to first thank uh, our everybody, Zane and, and Jim and Carol and and, and Dr. Turner and Dr. Hessel did, I mean, that was amazing. They, uh, and, and as Dr. Uh, Term, uh, Turner was speaking, in, in the back of my mind, I, I, I keep thinking of his latest book, which is just expanding uh, it all. And, and now we are uh, so privileged to be in the company of, of Jim Johnston and Carol Saltis, uh, whose contributions are, how do I put it? Um, uh, Carol, I, I hope you guys don't mind me calling you by, by first names because we we met. Uh, uh, it's 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 pandemic time, so we met on the internet. <laughs> and, <laughs> but we, we met anyway. So, um, but Carol, for example, in your article, you talk about the phrase that struck me was situational irony, and the the depth of the kind of the the humanity that both you and and, and Jim. Uh, kind of meditate on in your pieces to me is is just is just so touching but before i go and it's not my time to ask questions it is my time to to meditate uh to uh to to um um to kind of 
navigate this discussion just a little bit. Uh, who would like to speak first? I think I'm going to go first, and I'm going to talk about um, sort of the bio biography of Yarrow Mahmoud, and then Carol will talk about the art uh, and Charles Wilson Field. So if I can begin, should I begin now? And I will say the picture you're seeing on the screen at the moment on the left side uh, is uh, Yara Mahmoud painted by a local artist in Georgetown in 1822 named James Alexander Simpson. And that is at the uh, Georgetown Public Library in the Peabody Room. The portrait on the right is by Charles Wilson Peale, and that is uh, that was done in 1819. That's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where Carol is, and she was instrumental in acquiring that for them. Uh, you can see, of course, the difference, but it's the same man. And the portrait on the left was done um, three years after the one on the right. So you're looking at two different artists. But in terms of his biography, he was a Fulani Muslim born in 1736 in West Africa, uh, in Fouda Jalan probably, which is the Eastern part of Senegal and Guinea. Um, his name, Charles Wilson Peel has confused all of us with his name because he's reversed the name. Uh, his real name would have been Mamadou Yarrow. Uh, Mamadou is Islamic name and that would at least by European conventions, that would be his first name. Yarrow was really not his last name. It too was a given name. We don't know his last name. Uh, there were only about five last, what we would call surnames in, among the Fulani. Diallo was one of them. Uh, Yarrow was uh, brought to America on a slave ship in 1752, arriving in Annapolis, the same place that Diallo did. Uh, but uh, 22 years later, me, at least some of the people who knew Diallo were still alive in Annapolis, particularly one named Vachel Denton, uh, who was also knew the Peels, uh, and he knew the person who bought Yarrow off the slave ship, Samuel Bell, and that's B-E-A-L-L. -L. They were a prominent family in Maryland, um, they still are a prominent family in Maryland. Samuel Bell was a active politician, active in the American Revolution. When Yara was uh, with him, Yara was probably his body servant and so traveled around Maryland, uh, was probably not a field uh, hand, probably more of a person who would go with his owner all the time. In uh, when Samuel Bell died, Yarrow would have gone to his son, who had a business in Georgetown. That's the exclusive part of Washington, D.C., the original part of Washington, D.C. Yarrow probably worked there uh, to earn money on his own, even though he was still technically enslaved. But in 1796, he was freed. He still probably... <clears throat> lived with the Bells in Georgetown. In 1800, he bought a house and uh, uh, he bought a lot in Georgetown and built a house on it. One of the stories that's told about him is that at Christmas time, there was a curfew in Georgetown. African-Americans had to be off the streets by nine o'clock, but um, at Christmas Eve, they were allowed to go out and carol the white folks in Georgetown and that Yara would lead that caroling. And then the next morning would walk around on Christmas morning with a shotgun and fire it off as a signal for the rich white people to give donations uh, to the carolers. And that's significant to me in, in several ways. First of all, he's a Muslim and he's participating in the Christian tradition. Secondly, he was trusted by both the whites and blacks in Georgetown to uh, handle that money honestly and fairly and, and pass it around. In uh, 1819, Peel came to wa uh, Washington and painted that portrait. Peel had heard that Yarrow was 140 years old. He wasn't, he was 83. And that he owned a house and lot and bank stock, which he did. He was also a financier loaning money to white merchants. 
And Simpson did this portrait in 1822, probably independently. Simpson was only 17 years old when he painted that. And then I'm gonna quickly follow his family because it's relevant. Uh, he had a son named Aquila uh, and that boy called himself Aquila Yarrow, thus proving that Yarrow was indeed his last name. And Aquila married a woman named Mary Turner. And I speculate that Mary Turner may have come on the sla same slave ship, or her ancestors, her parents or grandparents, may also have been Fulani Muslims. Um, and they moved up to uh, a farm near Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, but in Maryland. Uh, Aquila died in 1832, but his widow became a midwife there, and that community is therefore named after her. Her name, she kept the name Mrs. Yarrow, an African name. And so there is this little community in Maryland named Yarrowsburg carrying this African name. Her great grand nephew went to Harvard in uh, 1923 and graduated in 1927. And uh, his relatives are still alive in Baltimore today. Uh, they tell, they knew, or, or their grandmother knew uh, Mary Turner, Mary Yarrow, the son's wife. And they tell me that uh, this grandmother always talked about education and the importance of education. And so there's this tradition, certainly in the Turner family today, of education. Most of these women have master's degrees uh, in education. Yarrow died on January 19th, 1823. Charles Wilson Peale wrote his obituary and put it in the Gettysburg Compiler but the obituary or death notices were put in uh, some 38 newspapers up and down the East Coast. And finally, uh, these were passed around so that in March of 1823, the Times of London uh, carried an obituary for him. And that I think is time for now Carol to pick up. Okay. Um... This Zane to you is uh, in the spirit of marinating. This is something that has been marinating and uh, I talked to Timur about it and he was very helpful. And I'll mention that again in a minute. Um, anyway, after I completed my article for the Muslim world, I just felt there was more to know about Yarrow and the possible relationship between his quote, success unquote, and his religion. Um, the fact he was uh, expressing his beliefs in public uh, was unsettling to me a little bit. Was he being a buffoon? Were people perceiving him as that, you know, praising God in the public square, so to speak? Uh, or was he then at that point, and had he been all along, living out aspects of his religious practice as an integral part of his life in North America? So I was trying to find out what, what that was all about. And so that's sort of, I'm just sort of beginning to uh, explore this. So did his religion help him survive in some way? Um, so I would like to, to briefly consider three different lenses through which Charles Wilson Peale's compelling portrait of the African-American Muslim former slave may be viewed. Uh, I believe, and I would like to be able to develop further, the premise that it is the third of these lenses that will allow us to understand this portrait more fully, and as a result, guide us into a deeper exploration of how the education of young Black Muslim boys in West Africa may have prepared them to cope, to deal with, to be um, the first of these possible lenses, um, I will call the white Anglo-Saxon slaveholder lens. Um, and a little over a decade ago, an art historian not fully aware of Yarrow's identity saw him through this lens and described him as a quote, poorly dressed old black man and someone who might best be described as a character. And in relating what he saw, um, he then, of in, in Peel's portrait, he then, you know, uh, called Peel out for being uh, creating a racist image. 
um, I guess he felt that the clothes make the man. And in any case, it's important to remember that Yarrow's response to Peel's portrait of him was, quote, it's Yarrow himself. Um, and I think one of the compelling things about Peel's portrait is, in fact, its dignity. It's a very powerful portrait. Um, he saw a complex figure, and he left not only his portrait, but he also left the narrative in his diary of Yarrow's behavior uh, and his history. And it's these two elements together that I would call what would be our second lens, which would be Peel's lens. And Peel's diary is really probably the basis for, as um, Jim mentioned, the obituary that Peel wrote. Um, uh, Peel owned a museum and it was stocked with portraits that he painted and some of his uh, sons painted um, uh, of individuals and they, they uh, Arrow's group as someone of extreme age. Uh, Peel was put on to Yarrow, not because he was a slave, but because he was supposedly 134 years old. And so Peel was very interested in longevity because he was planning to live to at least 100 and he wanted to learn more about this. And he felt that longevity was linked to a particular um, was an accomplishment. And so if you could live long, it meant that you were doing things right, if you were healthy and uh, could be productive. So this was all about personal improvement, personal um, power, personal ability. So he had a small group of these pictures already painted in his museum, and he wanted to add Yarrow's portrait to that. And he wanted to find out more about Yarrow. So he, he goes around and uh, his, his uh, nephew had told him about Yarrow because he lived in Georgetown and you know about this character. And then Peel finds out that he's not only this incredibly old person supposedly, um, but he is also someone who was financially savvy. He owned his own home. He had a bank account. He was, could lend people money. Uh, and so he had a kind of independence, you know, and he was sort of a well-known uh, person uh, there. But he was very much sort of his own guy. He wasn't, you know, dressed up. He could have afforded to uh, uh, walk around as a middle-class looking person, um, but he didn't. Um, and... Uh, Charles clearly admired Yarrow, and I think that that comes across in the intensely human image that he left behind. It's not a caricature. Um, it's a carefully detailed image of a fellow human being. And it's an image that projects amusement and solidity. Uh, and in fact, Yarrow was an engaging, shrewd person. He was nobody's fool. And Peel, who was very savvy himself, connected with this man uh, clearly um, and spent uh, time recording his portrait. So to sum up, Charles judged him to be a man of good cheer and a model of what he called industry, frugality, and sobriety. Uh, and he had not been dispirited by his servitude and the setbacks he had experienced. Um, he had been resourceful, and this is a word that comes up again, and may be very central to the training that, that uh, Yarrow may have had as a young man. Um, so Charles also noted um, that uh, Yarrow prof quote, professed to be a Mohammedan and is often seen in herds in the streets singing praises to God, unquote. He also noted that Yarrow said that, quote, religion is no good unless it comes from the heart, unquote. Um, two weeks ago, I mentioned my interest in Yarrow's religion and how it might have manifested itself in his life to Timur, uh, who recommended a book to me that has potentially provided some perspective and some answers on these, these questions. Um, it is Rudolf T. Ware III's The Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge, and History in West Africa. Thank you, Timur. Amazing book. Um, and it is here that I think we can find the best lens for seeing Yarrow more clearly. 
Um, and I would call that the lens of Yarrow's Quranic education. So how had this African slave who was literate in Arabic and praised God in the streets of Georgetown been trained? Ware's incredibly detailed research into the type of education Yarrow would have experienced as a boy in a Quranic school in West Africa is truly enlightening. Coming to North America at 16 years old, Yarrow would have been through the early years of his training, mastered reciting the Quran, and established his literacy in Arabic, which we know he had. The, uh, earliest years of his training would have been particularly important and rigorous since they were intended to be central to developing a student's sense of self. Physical discipline was important and it was believed that, quote, one who studies in hardship knows best, unquote. It was a process that, quote, formed men used to struggle and suffering, unquote. And this would make these boys clean vessels to prepare them to receive the word of God. The goal was the moral amelioration of the individual and the creation of resourceful individuals. There was fierce punishment for those who were shiftless or absent-minded. So to return briefly to the idea of clothing, um, we may also see that in the fact that the, uh, his attitude for clothing may have been somewhat shaped by the fact that as young students, these um, young men were compelled to beg. This is how many of these schools were supported through the alms that they received. But it was also considered that the act of asking for alms instilled humility and helped create good character. So they were compelled to do this by custom and religion. And it was, as I said, it was a source of income. But the, the idea that students would wear poor clothes clothing or rags. This was uh, just this, world, so to speak, if you can think of it that way. Um, and so the fact that he's wearing secondhand clothes that he gets from students at Georgetown School um, really may be a sort of throwback to that or a sense of, um, I don't have to dress myself up to be a worthy person. I can, I can be frugal and I can, and he certainly probably was very frugal and very careful about his money and, and so forth. But it, it, when you think about it in terms of how he might have been trained, so to speak, um, what the meaning of clothing might have to him is, is very different than it might have what we might think that as or other people um, might consider it as. Um, and that training might be very different from what Diallo had, where he was really uh, sort of, you know, part of a, a wealthy upper class thing, even though these boys were, they could be from anywhere. I mean, and, you know, that was that rank was not important, but this was a process. This was a part of their education uh, in becoming a good Muslim. So the, the, the other thing is to be sort of humbled by this alms, uh, seeking alms also um, was, as I said, making them prepared to hear the word of, of God and they learned the Quran by heart. That was the next sort of step in, in their uh, education so that these boys would in fact become a walking Quran. You didn't have to carry your Quran with you. You, you had it embodied, embedded in you in a way. Um, so to sum up, um, I think that all this deserves further attention so that we may better understand how Yarrow and many others um, may have brought their East African Muslim culture and religion with them to America in productive ways and how um, these disciplines and these ways of, of seeing reality help them navigate horrific situations or help them um, make um, be more resilient, be more resourceful, um, and help them uh, survive. And in fact, uh, be someone who could sit in front of someone like Charles Wilson Peel, and that Peel could see the dignity in this man because this is how he held himself and and 
how he navigated his life. You know, Peel would not have been aware of all of this, obviously. And he, uh, the man he confronted, I don't think he could truly take in the full spectrum of things and, and you know, within the conditions that they were all living. But there is no question that the two of them connected and that uh, Peel was able uh, to convey uh, the sort of essence of the man he saw in front of him. And I do know that people experiencing this painting, which I have seen many, many people do and talked to many, many people about it. Nobody dismisses this um, picture. Once you're in front of it, it is extremely powerful. Um, and it's, it's the sort of thing that um, picture, a, a work of art, a true, truly accomplished work uh, can do. It can uh, communicate across time and it can make us think about things. And I know that looking at Yara's face made me think more deeply about the process that he went through, the life that he lived and what shaped this man, what, what allowed him to be um, so uh, resilient and uh, so forth. And that was what Peel was asking himself too, certainly, and why he did want to memorialize him in portrait and in words. And, um, and his, the life he lived, in fact, did create a great deal of attention to have him um, to generate all of these obituaries, um, some of which, of course, were uh, serious and um, probably most of which were uh, purely just for newsworthy sake uh, if they connected it with an advanced age. So anyway, that's where I am. And um, I think uh, just one quote from, um, the Ware book, he talks about a, a student who went through this process like, like perhaps um, uh, Yarrow did, and he speaks about his teacher and the process he went through, and this was uh, in the 18th century anyway, so it co connects to the time frame of Yarrow, and he said of his, of, of his process, of his teacher, he said, I honor my teacher, I thank him because he taught me to work, he taught me to persevere patiently and to confront life. Um, so that's the end of my comments and my marination uh, of Yarrow. <laughs> uh, Carol and Jim, uh, first of all, I would like to invite everyone to uh, follow the practice uh, uh, from the previous panel. Uh, please submit your questions uh, via chat. Um, Nick will help me out by, by looking at the questions and then we'll invite you guys to, um, uh, to ask them. So uh, let me just kind of, um, um, I think it, it, it is a question to both of you, uh, uh, Carol and, 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 and Jim. So Carol, you just mentioned very, very briefly the obituaries. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, Jim, you're, uh, you are the only author in here who wrote two art, well, other than Zane, I think. No, that's it. You are the only author who wrote two articles in the same volume. You co-wrote an article with, um, with Asma Naim, uh, two museums and the Simpson portrait of Yaro Mahmoud. And then you wrote, you wrote uh, your own piece, Rethinking Yaro Mahmoud. And um, from what I can hear, much of what you said comes from your piece on Rethinking Yaro Mahmoud, but to connect that and connect it with obituaries. Let me just kind of, um, <clears throat> so one of the obituaries was uh, um, you and Asma Naim, I think, consider that it's possible that the person who wrote that obituary was Simpson, uh, okay. the, 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 right? And it's, uh, it has this very peculiar phrase. Uh, well, it starts with Yarrow dead, right? And then it says, uh, we remember to have seen anybody. And then he, then he says, what was taken of this harmless old man? When I read that, harmless old man that struck me, right? Why must harmless be inserted in there? What is going on there, right? Yeah. Can you, maybe, can you, can you say something on that? Well, uh, I, I think uh, the reason the harmless is inserted is because it was written by James Alexander Simpson, 
who was a 17 year old uh, up and coming artist in Georgetown and was, he really didn't, unlike Peel, he didn't really understand Yarrow. By the time Simpson did the po portrait, Yarrow was uh, six months from death. And so I think that's the way Simpson saw him. I think that Peel saw him quite differently. Carol, can you uh, maybe just kind of meditate on it a little bit? Because one of the uh, ways that your article struck me is how you um, try to um, um, to address to, to articulate how you think uh, Peel connected with uh, with with Muhammad Yaro. Um, and then it looks like there is a there is a little bit of your own connecting going on in there, right? Uh, and your own connecting, if I am right, um, uh, appears on pages 354, 355, um, where you write, the importance of religion coming from the heart was a belief the two men could share. And it was famously expressed in the book of Samuel in the Old Testament. It ran, for Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Can you comment on that? How did that come about? What, 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 what kind of a connection do you see there? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, oh, let's see. Well, it's, and it's also part of, of Rousseau and his thought that Peel was very into. Um, you know, that it's, it's that central part of feeling and uh, sensitivity and all, all of that. But I think, um, I, I think what Peel was going after was a sort of essence of the person, um, of, um, you know, it's so complicated when you're talking about someone like Yarrow, because the slave... gets objectified and dehumanized. And I think it's, you know, people tend to, to look at a portrait and say, oh, it's a slave. And then all of a sudden this torrent comes around and, and it's very hard to see. And I think that one of the great things about the portrait is that Peel kind of got emotionally into intuiting something about Yarrow and um, that, that it is the sort of inner of a person. We're talking about people's humanity they can relate over time and place through their humanity um, rather than being, you know, broken off into chunks of types of people um, that are in, in, against one another. And I think so Peel was was trying to build these these bridges and, and see things. It's not that he was some sort of perfect religious person. He wasn't particularly religious. He was he was sort of a deist and he was always looking at, at things. Um, I think it really does have to sort of boil down to a sense of common common humanity and looking for common humanity. I think that was something that he sought in his own not imperfect way and the way we look at things today and, and judge them as imperfect and less than all they should be. Um, but this was still a goal. And I think Yarrow was someone who was very natural. You know, he sort of embodied a lot of these things. That's why I started thinking about his religion and how, how he had sort of learned to center himself. I mean, he, he must have arrived here pretty much intact psychologically as a human being to be able to. Mari, I'm sure you could please give me a call back at two zero. At, um, to, to navigate the world that was in front of him bit by bit. So I think that's what I'm talking about. That may have been too depressive. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jim, do you wanna add anything? Well, I, I wanna go off in a little bit different direction. Uh, one of the things that I concluded in my book was that there was a small Muslim community. And let me, let me just talk about uh, the environment in Georgetown and, and 
Maryland at the time. I think that the slave ship that brought Yarrow uh, also brought other Muslims. I think that was from that part of Africa. And I know there was another Yarrow uh, in this area. I know that Yarrow had a sister. She would have been Muslim. And, and you can use uh, Fulani names to find in wills and things that there were other uh, Fulani in this area. So initially, he would have had a small community of people that had come from, quote, the old country, close quote, you know, that were Muslim, that would have reinforced his own religion. The environment among the white Christians in Georgetown was quite different, but they did know about Muslims, although that generally came from Shakespeare's Othello, because Muslims were generally called Moors in Georgetown at the time, but they were very much respected. Uh, and I think Yarrow was respected, but it's, it's also important to understand he was treated differently than almost every other African-American in Georgetown. He was on a much higher level. And I think that was probably because of his education and his, um, and his intellect. Uh, he was, there is some language quoted from him where he says that when he got free, his owner said uh, he got all the work out of a Yarrow bone so that Yarrow knew English well enough to know Mauro and was making a play on words and a joke. Uh, and so he had that degree of sophistication with English. Oh, I'm sorry, I was just writing down for my own okay. notes because this is amazing. Uh, but, <laughs> But, but if you don't mind, so we have a question from Mark Delancey. Um, Mark, do you want to ask the question yourself? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Sure. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, so yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to the, the differences in these, the, the way the figures are the manner in which the figures are presented in these portraits, uh, both these, the, the two portraits of Yaro and the one of Java, they seem very different presentations to the figures. So the, the Jalo one is very official, you know, looking directly at, at the, the viewer and um, uh, almost ambassadorial, I, I think. And, and uh, whereas the two portraits of Yaro, one's like this, friendly, kindly guy that um, the, the, the art that seems familiar. And, and the other, which I recall you saying was painted only a few years later, depicts him as really appearing quite old, you know, emphasizing the lines of his face, the goneness of his cheekbones, his head slightly bowed. Um, so, you know, what do we attribute these, these different ways of depicting these figures to? Is it, is it the... Uh, a question of, you know, what was the, the artist was in intentions in making these portraits was, or was it a question well, of the familiarity of the artist with the, the, the subject or what? Well, um, I think that is, uh, the main, the main thing is Charles Wilson Peel is a trained painter. Um, he has uh, a whole bag of tricks of rendering the physiognomy very carefully of light and shadow and all these nuances so that he brings the figure alive in a very sort of real way and he studies his physiognomy and he's careful about turning a collar up in one way and down in another so you've got visual interest in the picture that puzzles you into the picture sort of without you even knowing it he engages you he uses the sort of buff color um, of the uh, sort of make, made up Sufi that he's wear, kuf that he's wearing, and um, uh, um, all, all of these details. Uh, the other portrait is painted by a young artist, as Jim mentioned. He's 17, 17 years old, Jim, and um, uh, this is, it's different. It's more, to use a, not the greatest word, but it'll convey a more primitive style. Uh, he's doing the best he can. He's learning as he goes. He's making it interesting by the color, uh, using the color combinations to make it vib vibrant. He's using the pipe as an interesting little element, which probably was in fact Yarrow's pipe. And as Jim mentioned, it's a couple years later. He may, be, Yarrow may not be well at all. Um, and 
Um, he's not seeking in this portrait to do what Peel was also seeking. There's a difference of intention. Um, there's probably more of a sense of, uh, you know, Yarrow as the character. I don't think this is a caricature. I used to look at it and think it was. I now think it, he was just trying to paint Yarrow the best he could at his level of, of artistic um, development at that time. Um, but they're very different because, um, you know, uh, Peel is, is looking into the man. He's a seasoned portrait painter. He's in the last phase of his career, but painting at extremely high level. And um, it's totally, they're totally different uh, because of, of who's painting them and what that artist is seeking to convey. I don't think um, they're trying to convey the same thing, but they are depicting the same person, if that makes any, if that's helpful. Thank you. We have uh, one hand raised, um, uh, Jian Yu Liu. Can you please pick up? All right. So um, let me just ask a very broad question, if you do not mind, while we wait for, for more questions. Um, and you can take it whichever way you want. This is kind of your, your time to take it in any direction. So it's a very broad question. Why Yarrow? I'll go first. Uh, I think, first of all, Carol makes the point that Peel was very interested in aging. And he heard that Yarrow was 140 years old. And so there was this scientific interest. I. I, some, I give talks and I say there's another reason too in, in terms of the way he painted him that although uh, Peel had owned slaves when he was younger and when he lived in Maryland, he was getting pretty liberal at the time. And in the sense that he believed black people and white people were equal in terms of their skill. And so that here in Yarrow Mahmood is a man who owns his house and lot he owns bank stock. I mean, you know, what kind of black person at this time in American history would own bank stock? And he's loaning money to white merchants, you know? So he is sort of a, a, a pretty interesting guy. And I think that Peel painted him as a upper class Georgetowner who just happened to be black. Carol? Um. Yes, I mean, no matter what you say about Yarrow, he was an outlier, he was different. I mean, we would like to look, um, you know, we'd like to see the commonalities. One of the reasons I was interested in the sort of religious aspect and training he may have had was I'm trying to think what helped a, a black person survive. And I mean, we know that people survived and had families and moved on. Your work on, on Yarrow, of course, Jim, is a testament to that. And it's all around us. But, you know, how, how did it happen? How did this, this resilience come about? I mean, it would be wonderful to know more about those ways of those struggles of, of, of having a history of all of, of that. But, yeah. but we don't, but we do have, you know, we do have a glimpse. And I think, um, you know, Yarrow is a tantalizing glimpse, a hint a place, a, a directional signal of, of a, a, a direction, a sign of where where to go, where to look, dig deeper, find out more, find out who, find out the heroes of, of survival. Um, so, I mean, I sort of look at him that way. And Peel is a very difficult, in one way, person to deal with because he's not free of, uh, of prejudices, his friend, and, and what we would look at today more as prejudices, his friend was, um, you know, Dr. Benjamin Rush, and they had certain ideas about, you know, ethnic differences and so forth. You know, it wasn't evolved in the way that we like to think of things today. So you, um, it's, it's different, but, um, you know, I think, 
uh, Peel was fascinated. I mean, he kept a museum. He was very interested in ethnography. He was interested in the difference between people, the difference between animals, the people, that all the differences. He was trying to create a world that people could walk into in his museum and understand, you know, all, all of, of God's world um, there. So, um, Yarrow fits into to Peel's universe very well. Um, he doesn't have to look like everybody else, uh, and that's that's of interest, and that was of interest to to Peel, the individuality of the person. And you know, Peel was also someone who had his own problems and his own struggles, and I think he saw that in in another. Uh, a person. I mean, his his life had not been all that simple. His father had come to this country as a, you know, convicted felon and was an impecunious school teacher. And, you know, Peel struggled. Luckily, he had social connections um, through the gentry in Maryland that helped him succeed. But, it, you know, it was, uh, he had a, he had a, he had to make his own way. And he did. And he looked he looked at people, um, evaluated people sort of on their guts and their courage and their ability to navigate in the world. And I think that's, there was a little bit of a mirror there when he looked at Yarrow and saw what, what he had navigated and was able to do. So I think there was a common th thread there, even though you'd think they would be miles apart. I don't know, what do you think, Jim? You'd well, I, I, I think that's right. But um, I also want to interject something. You know, we mentioned Asma Naim, who co-authored one of the articles on Simpson. Uh, you know, she was troubled by the fact she worked at the uh, National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. She was troubled by the fact that there weren't any or few, if any, portraits of uh, Black people in, in the portrait gallery. And so she uh, got the Simpson painting bar loaned to the National Portrait Gallery and uh, on display for three years there in the attempt to uh, diversify the National Portrait Gallery. And I think the same problem happens with the National Portrait Gallery in England, that uh, the Diallo painting is one of the few paintings of someone with a skin color that's uh, other than white. Yeah. So if you don't mind, there, there is a question I want to, and if nobody asked the question, I will, I will ask another question. But uh, Elizabeth Brown had a question. Uh, would you okay. be, Elizabeth, can you please speak up? Okay, thank you. Yes, I was just wondering in the, and I wrote Mahmoud, but I understand, sorry, it's Yarrow is, we're referring to him as his last name Yarrow, even though it appears first. Sorry about that. In the Peel painting, I was just wondering, do we know if the, if the clothes that Yarrow is um, represented in, were these his own clothes or were they supplied to him? Yes, well, they were apparently his own clothes. Jim believes that the coat around his um, shoulders um, was perhaps Peel's coat because it was cold in Georgetown and this was like a big leather coat and it seemed like it was might might have been Peel's. I mean the, the blue jacket we know that he got he bought clothes from the boys at Georgetown and this was one of their little like uniform blue blazer jackets um, which is why I was sort of talking about clothing and his his ability to take on hand hand me down clothing and and the the kufi the cap the the you know which seems to be a very sort of American generic knitted cap yet when you look at it on his head it looks like uh, you know the Muslim headgear and that peel sort of makes it, it even more so with that big broad stripe stripe around it but it's. Um, yes, I think those were his clothes, and I think that was the point, and I think um, it, it's important to realize that Peel was a sort of ethnographic person. He was, for his museum, he was trying to show people as they were, uh, not to make them into something they weren't, or wearing clothes that were fictive. Um, and he had just come off painting a lot of people, a lot of, of 
uh, politicians and the president in Washington for his portrait gallery. And of course, they were all dressed up in their beautiful dark suits and everything, and they would look great in the gallery when he took them home. Um, so this was totally different. And uh, but he's he's showing him as he is. Also, just to mention that his son, Raphael Peel, had painted two of the major Black clergymen in Philadelphia a number of years earlier. And they are both presented in their clerical garb. So they are presented in their socially public kind of way. Uh, Peel's politicians are also presented in their beautiful, you know, frock coats and so in their way. So that's their mode. That, that describes them. That's part of their identity. And these clothes were part of what Peel saw in front of him. These were part of Yarrow's identity. And yes, they are his. They're not, um, I don't think we can make them into something else. And, yeah. and you know, if you think of this, they're actually wearing, he's actually wearing the same clothes in both portraits. Yeah. A red Minus the coat. coat. Yeah. And notice how Peel has turned the collar up uh, on, yeah. on that painting. And yeah. If you don't mind, I have, um, we have a few minutes, but I do want to uh, kind of note that um, uh, uh, Georgia has responded to Mark's question, which is just kind of note take a note of that. But uh, <clears throat> let me just, um, I kind of have been dancing around it with my questions. <laughs> so I'm just going to go ahead and be blunt. So um, to rephrase it, uh, like, for example, Carol, you are responsible for bringing the portrait to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, no, not no, not just. I was. I'm. I'm a curator in the Department of American Art, and I was there when we raised an enormous amount of money to get it. And um, I was part of a team doing this, and we got we sold two other Peel paintings to add to get this one painting. And I mean, it was it was a wonderful, successful moment. And uh, boy, we love it. <laughs> oh, so so let me just kind of. Uh, to you and, and Jim, to you, uh, the same question. Why, why Mamadou Yaro to you? What, not to Peel, right? <laughs> but to you. Well, let me, I'll start. You know, whenever you write, I've done several biographies. And, and when you do it, uh, you become like it, you, you, you bond with the person you're writing about. Yeah. And, uh, I bonded with Yaro Mahmoud. I'm uh, in real life a lawyer and I've, I have gone to uh, meetings in Washington about Yaro and I've said I'm Yaro's lawyer because I feel he's sort of my client. And <laughs> that's part of what it means to me. It also, uh, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was from came from Lebanon both my parents did and so I knew them and when I looked at Yarrow I started seeing even though he came on a slave ship and my grandparents came as free people I started seeing a great deal of commonality in the experience of coming from my grandfather would call it the old country uh, coming from the old country and trying to make make their way in a new world as you Timor are, are doing. So uh, that also was part of it. Thank you. So we have one minute left till our panel is over. So Rachel Lovett has raised her hand. Rachel, would you like to speak up? Yes, I'd love to. So hi, Jim, Carol. Um, this has been a really cool, um, Symposium so far. My museum, I'm a curator in Annapolis, has connections to both Diallo and to Yarrow. Um, so I know there's one other portrait that Charles Wilson Peale did of an African American specifically, which is James. It was on the Eastern mm -hmm. Shore of Maryland. And yeah. he was painting him, I believe, because he had vitiligo, which is a condition where you gradually right. turn white. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, that's made under very different circumstances than mm -hmm. Yarrow's portrait. Um, and that I, I kind of wanted you to, to mention what you, what you thought of that um, comparison. And also the fact that Yarrow's portrait was, Peel paid him for that portrait and whether that gave him more or less yeah. agency with that. So yeah, yeah. 
he paid him to sit for him, which I think um, uh, is the reason you see that slightly humorous expression on Yarrow's face. <laughs> I've been paid to I've been paid to do this, um, and I think that's all part of the wonderful transaction and and you know the thing it's it's all part of the same piece of the puzzle um james uh which i mentioned in the article i mentioned him in the article it's a very different thing you look at james the james portrait um is an example of a sort of specimen portrait he is something that is uh, documentable in the museum uh yarrow kind of trans he 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 sort of is is bigger than that um, because he's both a personality and a representation, but and a representation of age. Uh, it's it's different. He's not just a specimen. James was, and he also is related to his friendship with uh, Dr. Rush, um, who they felt that that disease was an example of how perhaps um, people would. Uh, transform from being having black skin to having white skin and maybe this was a way out of this horrible situation everyone was in with slavery and whatever and uh so it was they were the you know the confusion of the thought about all of these things these people were all involved in 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 the abolitionist uh, endeavors in various ways and of course you know peel was as uh, at the head of the national, the abolition, gradual abolition act. Um, so people had their, their feet kind of in both places. They were trying to get through something that was really horrific. And um, so there's a, there's a spectrum. I mean, as you would expect, these people are sort of living, living the, the process of their lives and these things are coming up, but the James portrait, is very different and it's interesting uh, you bring it up because it it really sheds, uh, you know, throws a, a light, a spotlight on how different, um, you know, we can't compare the two portraits because we don't know what the other one is, but you, I would assume that it was a very straightforward kind of portrait. Um, and uh, not, not what you see here. And we don't know anything about him uh, really other than his identity, uh, as a slave, and uh, that's very limited. Where we know, you know, Peel goes on and on trying to find out more and more about Yarrow. So it's different. So, if you don't mind, as if, as with anything that is uh, supremely enjoyable and wonderful in in life, it looks like our time has come to an end. <laughs> right? It just went by so fast. But uh, what I would like us uh, to do uh, very soon, we will have another panel at 12.50. Uh, so we will be back. I'm grateful to Julie for, uh, for arranging what you will see next, which is this wonderful uh, slideshow is not the right word for it. But, but as, as um, if, if those of us who have time to do that, what I, as, as Jim and, and, and Carol, as you spoke, I kept looking at, um, at Charles Wilson Peel's portrait of, of Yaro Mahmoud. And um, it's, it's to be meditated about. It's to be meditated with. It is, it is um, there is a bittersweet note to it, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah. Th thank you. This session is going to have a conversation and um, some some wonderful, I think, presentations between Rebecca uh, Hankins. Did I get that correctly? I know I was so worried. Okay, thank you. And then Laura Macaluso. And um, <laughs> over their contributions to this issue. And so we will have uh, them present and then discuss with each other. And then we'll have some Q and A as we've done in the previous sessions towards the end. Um, and so please, uh, who, who would like to go first? Uh, I think Laura and I both <laughs> said that I'll go first because I'm gonna do a, just a short thank you. There's some Wonderful. people uh, that I want to thank. And um, of course, wanna thank you and Dr. Abdullah and the publishers, of course of the special edition. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a few other people I wanted to talk to, and then I'll let Laura go ahead and, and, and do her introduction. So uh, one of the individuals I do want to thank was my co-author, Dr. Bal Balthazar Beckett, who was so important to shaping this essay. I also want to thank my colleagues at the Amistad Research Center at Tulane University, who are always so supportive and generous with their assistance with this research. And I also want to thank my co-panelists, uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Macaluso, who was so helpful when I needed assistance, especially getting photographs and access to materials. She was just so generous and uh, and even sharing her own personal photos with me. I want to acknowledge a number of my colleagues who are here. I really appreciate them uh, coming uh, to listen to me. And uh, my dear friend, uh, who is an artist and scholar and who I worked with on so much research and has been central to my knowledge of art in general and Black artists in particular, uh, Paula Allen, uh, who is the curator of art uh, at the Amistad Research Center. Uh, finally, I do want to say something about uh, dedicating this work that I've done to Dr. Margaret Vendries. She was a friend and colleague who I worked with at Amistad Research Center and who passed away last month. It was so shocking to me. And whose thesis, Art in the Archives, the origins of art representing the core of the Aaron Douglas collection from the Amistad Research Collection was so important to my work on this essay. Over to you, Laura. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I thought it just would be um, in line with an introduction of the project that Rebecca and I have both been involved in on, you know, for a long time, but also a reference back to um, what we've been talking about this morning. Um, you know, why are, are, why are we doing this work and how long it takes to do this work and the idea of marination um, over, you know, many years. Um, I am particularly grateful to um, have been asked to participate because, um, you know, it, it seems like a different world now, but in the year 2016, you know, I published a book called Art of the Amistad and the Portrait of Cinque. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a very, I think, you know, very narrow um, uh, prescriptive and even prejudiced view of the Portrait of Cinque, who is the subject of, you know, our panel today. Um, and in my work, I really neglected um, almost totally, you know, to address the fact that um, this portrait is of a Muslim African man. And I think it's because of where I came from, how I grew up, my education, et cetera, those things that we struggle against um, in the academy, outside of the academy, et cetera. And so when Professor Abdullah asked if I was interested in participating in this journal issue, I was kind of like, <laughs> you know, been there, done that, you know, wrote a book. I don't have anything else to say. How wrong, you know, I was, absolutely. Um, and it is very unusual, I think, in our field to have the opportunity to revisit your own work and to fix your own work, if you will, in a public way. And I think it's, amazing to listen to you all today and to place the portrait of Cinque in a much bigger context, a context that I think he belongs in and that I wish um, the portrait had, it was given more time. And so this is another way that we can kind of get the portrait out there. But um, I also have some pictures to show you if we have some time, um, he is hanging right now. This, you know, kind of smallish portrait um, of this man is hanging right now in Washington, D.C., which means he's being seen by a lot more people. And, you know, he keeps coming around again. So I think we're going to talk about um, all of these things, public memory and um, marginalization and, and fixing what has been wrong and you know, opening the doors um, to uh, better history and, you know, better memory making, if you will. So 
Um, uh, with that, I'm going to um, let maybe Rebecca um, start us off with some questions because she has had some recent experience teaching public memory. So I'm thrilled to be doing this with her. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Laura. Yes. Um, so last year, uh, I co-taught a course with uh, a, a colleague in performance studies, Dr. D David Doncor. And the course was, was talking about reframing, pub, that was the title, reframe, reframing public memory, racism embodiment and the cultural imagination. And this story of Sinke and the Amistad Africans is, is so appropriate and central to some of the things that we talked about in this course. And his image and the fact of the Amistad Africans uh, uh, and how the public memorializes them and how they are treated within the public memory uh, is, is so, it, it resonates with what is going on quite a bit now. And when we say public memory, we imply that that we can call public exists and possesses memory. People can remember things collectively. Um, they can remember things individually. And, and um, it's a kind of memory that occurs in open and oftentimes in front. And this is what memorials and statues and some of the artwork that we've all been talking about is that public memory. Uh, so in the course, we pay particular attention to public monuments and place in the often contentious arena of public memory. And Laura shared something that is coming back to haunt us uh, um, in terms of public memory. Uh, on Facebook, there's been this discussion and I, um, a statue of an African and chains, and maybe you want to talk a little bit more about those issues of representation and what's going on with that particular image. Sure, just going to grab it here. Um, so let me do this. If I, if I, I don't want to share the slideshow. I just want to have this be by itself on the screen. Do this down here, I think. There. So, folks, um, you might be interested to know um, that the portrait of Sinke um, has given life to so much more, you know, than than just oil on canvas, right? It has spread itself for you know two hundred years um, across the world, really. Um, but as you can imagine, a portrait that is made in a particular in a particular place, which was Connecticut, um, because the Amistad story really had a lot of life here, um, continues to kind of come back up and kind of bite us in the butt, as Rebecca was kind of indicating and saying, you know, wait a second here, we're not silent. You know, we've got something to say. And the portrait of um, Sinke became, if you will, a, a statue, um, but a tiny one. A, well, it's not tiny, but it seems to be from the ground because it sits on top of a flagpole in the capital city of Connecticut called Hartford, Connecticut, right? And so you see um, Sinke portrayed in gold leaf on the left side of your screen. He's not sitting on the top of a flagpole. And a couple of weeks ago, um, because of social media or you know, due to social media or enabled by social media, you know, an argument um, came around, um, posted by a man from Hartford who said, when someone ever say Hartford, Connecticut is a racist city, they're telling the truth. Main Street, Old State House was a slave trading post for slaves today, still standing a black man with shackles on a post to prove it. So he wrote this on Facebook and of course it you know kind of blew up and got a lot of attention a lot of people um have you know lot, lots to say and um it's I was you know putting up this picture this morning and realizing oh think is on top of the state flag um which in Connecticut our motto is he who transplanted still still sustains 
which is pretty interesting considering that Senge didn't want to sustain <laughs> here in the United States. He wanted to go back to his home in Sierra Leone. And, you know, he very much helped make that happen, right? He has just a tremendous amount of agency in his own story. So the problem with public memory here is that it hasn't been kind of shared with the public perhaps enough so that the view of the man who posted this is, is a one-sided view that, oh, he's in shackles and he shouldn't be. This is our capital city. Why should I have to look at a man, at a black man in shackles, right? But he's not kind of like capturing the rest of the, um, the whole rest of the Amasad story in which Senke is the player, you know, in, in so many ways and has the agency and has the power. Um, and that's why his, he's the one of the 53 Africans who were taken together on the ship called the Amistad. He is the one who becomes the name, the representation for the whole story. So thank you for letting me share that. We can, you, you all can ask questions and we can get back to that later if you'd like. And I'll tell a little bit about that story. I think it is important to know um, that it wasn't just Senke. It was all of the Amistad Africans, these 50 through 53 Africans who were uh, captured in violation of the international slave trade. Um, and they were on their way to Cuba, uh, to a, a plantation when they uh, literally revolted. And they also, they killed all of the crew except two members. And those members, they asked those, those two individuals to um, send them back, to, you know, take them back to, uh, Af to the shores of Africa. They wanted to go towards the rising sun, but each day those Cubans reversed direction. And it found, it wound up the ship itself, um, wound up in Long Island, New York, when the Africans were jailed and charged with piracy and murder. Um, so this, this is a very celebrated case. Senke was a part of that. He led uh, many of the, the Africans on that ship to uh, find their freedom. And it's an interesting story in so many levels because there's this whole idea of <clears throat> one of the main reasons why they revolted is that they overheard the cook on the ships talking about eating them. And they were so afraid of the whole notion of cannibalism, which they had heard of, that that is what really prompted them to attack the crew and take over the crew. Uh, and so this, this group of abol Christian abolitionists uh, headed by Lewis Tappan, and he was one of the famous Tappan brothers. They were financiers. They were very big Christian um, <clears throat> abolitionists too. Um, uh, they were very much engaged in uh, um, anti-slavery work. They formed an Amistad committee to um, to literally fight to keep these Africans out of prison and to keep them from going to Cuba for sl and sl to slave plantations because uh, <clears throat> the Cuban government, of course, wanted their property um, back. So it's a very interesting uh, story. It, it's a celebrated story. It talks about um, just the how the Africans really were so instrumental in, in their own defense. It was so important for them to take part in there and have their own agency, as, as Laura mentioned. And so this case eventually wound its way through the US court system, finally getting before the Supreme Court, where it was argued by the former president, John Quincy Adams. And this case, which had such implications for these Africans, and they were victorious, was very interesting in that the institution of slavery still continued in the, the Americas, even in spite of the fact that these Africans 
won their case. So it is, um, it's a really uplifting story in so many ways in terms of talking about Africans who fought uh, for their freedom and won, um, but also um, when you look juxtaposed it against what was still going on in the U US, it, um, it, it's still even a remarkable story because of that. So uh, anything you want to add to that? Because one of the things in Laura's book, if you haven't read her book on Senke, it is amazing because she talks about how Senke's image was one of the most prolifically created image during that time. And you want, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. So she is right. Um, you know, right from the get go. Um, I don't know whether you all, the audience members, our fellow panelists, um, have seen the movie Amistad. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of problematic. Um, but it, he's Isinke is the only kind of the story of the Amistad is I think the only subject of any of the topics in the Muslim World Journal issue you know that was taken up by uh, you know a famous director Steven Spielberg right so um, and if you remember that movie at all I mean yes there's a lot of challenges a lot of issues and problems um, but the New Haven image the portrait image of Sinke is there. I mean, it's just always there. You cannot get away from it. So I think my question, you know, in looking back at this is, what were the choices made about representing this man in an oil painting? How did the, how did Nathaniel Jocelyn, the painter, get there? Because it's, you know, it's not like he just appeared on the scene and I'm going to paint this. I mean, there's, even though it's a small amount of time, it's just, you know, a year from where, when this ship, the Amistad ship, appears off Montauk Point, Long Island, to the grabbing, basically, of the Amistad Africans, they're brought to New London, Connecticut, and then they're brought to New Haven, Connecticut, where they kind of are located for a while as the case begins to move through local, state, and eventually to the national, you know, system, trial system. Um, but immediately things, artwork is made. You know, immediately, I mean, the ship is off of, of uh, Long Island Sound and the ship is being painted in this in this famous work of art. It's amazing really to have this. Um, and I kind of argue in my book that you know, you're getting the first representation of the Af Africans right here. Um, and not a lot of attention has been you know, paid to them and what they're doing, how that interaction um, with the whites on shore is, is beginning. Um, and then you do get print work, kind of print culture takes over. It's the medium of the night, or the certainly of the early 19th century, right? Um, and this is the one image that I think you might all be interested in, and maybe you can even help help me, help us, um, because I feel like it has not been dissected enough, and I know I did not do that um, well enough at all, but I know it's important. It's one of the first representations of Sinke or Sengbe Pie, as he is also sometimes called, um, his African name. And it is the closest thing I think we have to the realization that in art, he, he is shown you know, very much an Islamic warrior, I think, here. There's a lot of little details to tell us um, that he is kind of something special. Um, but it's not going to be the image that sustains the Amistad story. It's going to be eclipsed. And I I think, you know, along with Rebecca's work um, on the American Mich Missionary Society and the way the missionaries, you know, kind of adapt, adopt the story for their own needs, right? Because they've got abolition on, on their mind and they have to get the tools to do it. That's what Sinke is going to become for them. So they're going to get rid of his Muslim identity, basically. And so this is kind of the last time that we see, I think, an overt indication um, you know, that he is not a Christian man, right? And so we do have, I think I showed you already, you know, we've got some violent scenes um, and Sinke can, can sometimes be identified, but we also have some examples in New Haven of this kind of interest in the Amistad story from um, a uh, quote unquote scientific 
perspective, and we know that their science, you know, leans towards um, a, a creating and uplifting, up, upholding a racism based on the color of skin. And I think we see a lot of that kind of going back and forth in the print culture that begins. But, you know, there's also these little moments like a New Haven or John Warner Barber showing people, you know, here's the conditions they you know human beings are packed in a ship that is three feet three inches high that's the only space they're given and it's kind of the first time maybe that let's say you're in connecticut and the era is 1839 and you're seeing the inside of a slave ship you know it's pretty powerful stuff um there's so much to say you know but i'm just kind of running you through um the creation making around the use of the amistad and and Cinque. And he come, becomes very quickly, as I said earlier, um, the representation, the person, the person, and the personality whose whose face and whose presence becomes the Amistad story. And so, finally, um, in real life, he is painted in real life over the winter of 1840, 1841. It is right before the trial goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. The painting is almost meaningless for people. Um, it's the print, which is shown here, that disseminates throughout the Atlantic world that then helps shift people's attitudes towards uh, the violence that was the Amistad and, you know, gets the public kind of on the side of these Africans for freedom. So <laughs> that's, that's my bit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That, that is amazing. And I think um, the way I looked at it, uh, I, I was looking at the artwork of much more contemporary artists, uh, Hal Woodruff, Romare Beard, and Jacob Lawrence, and their depiction of uh, the Amistad, because these artists, these Black artists, were very central to looking at um, and, and really pushing Black art too at, from uh, uh, an African, African American um, perspective. And so you see on the right side, Romare Bearden's collage of uh, the Amistad revolt on the ship and Senke. And then on the right side is Jacob Lawrence's. This was um, a sesquicentennial porch uh, painting that he did of a, a poster that he did of the Amistad revolt. And you really have to look very closely at this to even see the, uh, the violence that is, that is taking place, the hands, the white hands, the black hands, the black faces. It's, it's a very abstract um, image but it definitely depicts, and that's what's very interesting to me, um, it, it does depict the violence, it does depict uh, what these Africans have, have had to go through. And I thought that was so fascinating, looking at how they, uh, these, um, and, and, and Hal Woodruff's um, series on the Amistad, it's, probably one of the most well-known uh, series on the Amistad Africans. And then you see this image that he also has of um, the court scene where you have the Africans in these westernized clothing and, and being very central uh, to the defense of them. So I think it's very important to also look at how uh, African African Americans really imagined um, the the Amistad revolt and the and Senke and all of them, and it's very very interesting. And that's one of the things that I talk about in my essay is the difference in how some of these uh, how how these African Americans depicted um, the Amistad Africans. So maybe. <laughs> I'm thinking, Rebecca, if I can get my screen to allow me to go back. I feel like it goes to sleep and then it doesn't move. It's not moving. I want to go back to the portrait of Sinke so we everyone can have another look. Um, 
it's not letting you move in that it's right. not shoot i'm not sure oh, there it goes it just it really takes my laptop takes a lot of time to wake itself up um yeah um if if people just want to kind of um in, enjoy this for a moment um review it um i don't know how much time you've ever spent uh, with the portrait of St. Gay, um, it appears um, to be a lifelike, you know, question mark uh, representation. Um, the portrait artist, Nathaniel Jocelyn, does not have any real extant diaries or receipts or anything like that. No extensive archival collections. So we don't know much from his perspective. And the only thing that we know about Sinke, who sat for the portrait in the New Haven studio is that um, according to an abolitionist in Farmington, Connecticut named Charlotte Coles, the story is that Sinke saw the portrait and expressed the uh, sentiment saying, it was good, good, like that word good <laughs> was from his mouth, um, according to Charlotte Coles. At, at Farmington, Connecticut was a huge abolitionist community who had taken in the Amistad Africans after um, they won their freedom at the Supreme Court. The problem was that they won their freedom, but they had no money to go back to Africa. And so the abolitionists, uh, Louis Chapin and uh, Etc. had to help the Amistad Africans, those who had not perished, because in fact, um, several people died in the New Haven jail and they're buried in New Haven at Grove Street Cemetery. So the, the, you know, the original group was not the same people, but those who did live and those who did go back, um, it took them almost two years to raise the funds um, to, to go back to Sierra Leone. So um, this painting, as I said, was actually then purchased by um, an abolitionist in Philadelphia named Robert Purvis. And he was a half black, half white man um, who was a businessman and very successful. And I think a lot of his funds kind of contributed to um, abolitionist causes. His house is a sad wreck um, in Philadelphia. There's a historic marker outside um, but it, it, the last time I saw it was maybe five years ago and it had not been um, uh, taken care of just or preserved or anything just yet. But this painting hung and over the desk of Robert Purvis's um, in his study until the 1890s when it was then donated to the New Haven, what is now the New Haven Museum. And it's been at that museum ever since. Um, so no one, basically saw the oil on canvas painting, they saw the prints that were sold in what were called anti-slavery storefronts um, on both sides. We know that they sold um, in London and, and we know they were sold at the, on the Atlantic uh, coastline, Northern <laughs> Atlantic coastline. Um, so it's very much, um, you know, if, if anyone wants to um, say anything about, you know, what they're seeing in terms of the other portraits that we have seen today as a comparison. You know, art historians love comparisons. <laughs> so anything, you know, that you want to talk about, uh, the use of color, color, color the use of um, the direction the body's facing, um, the background, all those things are of, of interest um, to us, if, if anyone wants to share or, or talk about that. And if not, also I can show you where he is right now because he's not in Philadelphia and he's not in New Haven. Um, so right now in, in DC is a traveling exhibit that originated in Brazil, um, then it went to Houston and now it's at the National Gallery on the mall and it's called Afro-Atlantic Histories. And um, he's, you know, he's there. And let me tell you, he looks, Looks really good. Um, here, here he is hanging um, with you know just you know just this lovely color of the walls that were chosen, a reflection I'm sure of of water, and just the portrait looking just so bright and vibrant. Um, 
it might not, you might not realize this, um, but he hangs behind plexiglass in his real life in the New Haven Museum. He is behind a plexiglass box. And so for, to see it, you know, I did get in trouble. I did, it was told to move back. <laughs> Oh, I, you know, just seeing the details and getting up close, the color is, is just gorgeous. He looks terrific. Um, and uh, I see two hands, so we're going to be happy to answer those questions. Let me just point out this one other portrait that painting that kind of just blew me away. Never saw, never heard of this before. This is why it's good to get yourself out and go see museum exhibits. Um, this painting from France, predating the Amistad story of a slave rebellion on a ship and look at the activity, you know, of this man portrayed. Uh, I, I don't know anything about the story, but what I re I'm reading here, like you. Um, so it's, you know, he's, the portrait of Cinque is part of a transatlantic story um, and it's unique, but it also has, you know, it has some commonalities with, with, um, the story for a lot of people, what they're put through. So I don't know, maybe can our, can Nick help us with the questions? <laughs> yes, certainly. We, we have a few hands raised um, and I will do my best to call upon those who have them. Let's see. Um, okay, is, is there a way we can um, take the, the, the image off um, my best here yeah i think you need i think laura needs to stop share okay okay oh, but i can't the, the, the i can't thing, guarantee that i'm going to be able to get it back <laughs> no it's fine i mean i i i can i can see that i there's three hands raised but i can't see who they are so oh. i, I want to call i want to call upon them Let, so they can uh, ask well, their questions i can but, see their names nick you can okay i can well, Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say that Georgia Hasseldean is. Yeah, OK, please, please, Georgia, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, my God, that was so interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Laura. Um, I really enjoyed that. It was, it was loads of stuff that I've not seen before and just really wonderful to hear you expand on what's in your two fantastic essays as well. Um, I guess I was just really interested in that image Laura that you showed us and I've got got my copy of the journal open so I can keep looking at it um of what you described as like the 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 sort of the basically the first and last image of Chinke in um in what seems to be kind of Islamic inspired or imagined dress and but I just thought it was such a wonderful print I just kind of wanted to dwell on it a little bit longer because I think it's just so um it's like all the textures in it are incredible and it's made such good use of you know the kind of the action of engraving to create all these patterns but I think the thing that really blew me away was was the the the, the fabrics actually and how interesting those are and just thinking about how um I just wonder, I guess it's more of an open open question really. It's just like, if there's anyone on this call who can talk a bit more about that, because I feel like they should help us, you know, are these imagined or do we feel like this is helping us place him? And, and, and I don't know, I just think it's so interesting because compared to when we look at the, the kind of, you know, the famous painting where he's kind of almost been erased behind what I would see as a kind of representation of a kind of, um, almost like an allegorical figure of Africa. And, you know, you can see representations that look basically like that, but with someone who perhaps looks very slightly different, you know, in mise and pottery, in, you know, in, in 16th century engravings, you know, he's just like, he's everywhere. Whereas this one feels really new and very interesting. So I just, I'd love to hear a bit more about what you both think about it. Um, I, I do have something to say, but Rebecca, Rebecca first, do you have, want to jump in? Well, I think it is what you're saying, this slow, uh, well, it wasn't slow, this slow erasure of, of his Muslim identity. And if you look at the, um, really the iconic statue of uh, the Amistad 
revolt and the Amistad uh, sinking, which is the triptych that is in um, in Connecticut. You, there's one image of him. It looks like African clothing, but it it's it's really interesting. It's almost they've erased all of his Africanness, and you see him with the book, and you see him. Uh, in, in, in this triptych where uh, there's no representation of, of him as uh, anything other than um, the imagination of the individuals who created. And I think that's the same thing that you see also with um, the image of the, the, one of the initial images of Senke with the uh, omelet bag uh, similar to uh, Jalo and, 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 and Yaro Mahmoud, they have that omelet bag. But again, it's these images are no longer uh, connected with the Amistad, even to the point where you have scholars um, of just you know, dismissing that aspect of their, of their identity. So yeah, but go ahead, Lola. I'm going to, uh, Rebecca, I'm going to try to raise Marcus Redeker's name in your eyes a little bit <laughs> by, by actually uh, using um, one of the things I think, he, I'm, I'm pretty sure this, he, he's the one that turned me on to this. Um, Georgia, to your question, do I have it? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, can you all see these images? I know it's, it's small, but you can still see them, right? Um, so the portrait of Cinque, you know, became three-dimensional, as Rebecca just mentioned, in lots of different monuments in the 20th century, not only, you know, in Connecticut, but also all over Sierra Leone. And he's on their money. I mean, you know, Nathaniel Jocelyn, this, you know, un, this totally forgotten New Haven artist is, you know, it kind of has this famous now portrait on Sierra Leonean money. But here in Georgia, what you're seeing is that um, West Africans will absolutely, <laughs> you know, put the color back into uh, Stinke's toga every single time, every single time. It's just an amazing, I think, example, you know, of how you can readapt, reshape for your needs to reflect you, who you are. Um, and so, the portrait that we all know, this you know bright white toga that we know did not exist ever in real life. Certainly, Cinque did not walk around New Haven, Connecticut, wearing a bright white toga. Neither did anybody else. Um, you know, Americans have a hard time with togas, um, and we don't really do them that well. Um, and I was thinking about one of the earliest um, monuments to George Washington, <laughs> where he's he's basically nude and then wearing this toga. And everyone hated it from the beginning. And they put the statue in the basement because it was just so problematic. But you know, in, in the context of Cinque, they kind of, I think they're reviving the toga because of the idea of this whiteness, this purity that they're assigning to, you know, his goodness, his good internal moral character. He's also very Christ-like, I think, presented this way. Christ's body's wrapped in a, in a white shroud after he sacrificed, you know, so there's a lot of, I think, of this kind of back and forth over the course of history, but that doesn't make any sense, you know, if you are Sierra Leonean. <laughs> and so um, there is something Georgia called country cloth, which is made um, in, in West African communities, and it's, it's patterned it's colorful, it's striped, and so you see it very often. So I, I hope that's at least a start there, George. <laughs> All right. Um, there was a question by Ali Dinar. Ali? Hi, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, my question also is just about the toga uh, in the portrait of Sinke. Uh, when I look at it here, um, it just reminds me more of the dress of Eastern Africans and not those of West Africans. And, um, and that brings this issue about uh, clothing, like just in general, because like when we compare such pictures with people who are scantily clothed, 
and compare that to images of uh, in other situations, like say, for example, uh, the image of Mansa Musa at the time when he is like uh, fully draped uh, in all this kind of lavish clothes. Um, I think it has something to do also with people who will be uh, stripped of their identity and then uh, and again like being uh, reclothed in the image of the of the of the oppressor and um, and when I look at this image here it just like um, it just reminds me of that kind of a situation and when we especially like when we compare this image to the other image of Sinke in this uh, what we could just call it like a uh, um, Muslim uh, head, head piece and so on. Uh, I think um, uh, the, the, there is a rich history of uh, African clothing, especially like in, in West Africa. And, um, and so all these kinds of colors, uh, mm -hmm. on all these kinds of dyes, I mean, it just goes in hand. And, um, <clears throat> and so, all that that um, picture is just uh, missed in the depiction of uh, Africans uh, in thank the. You. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Um... And I think somebody Elaine mentions in here, and, mm. and it's something I had thought about too. That if you thought that they were in, you know, maybe that this is the 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 clothing worn during Hajj. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm perfect. I know that that is definitely not what they were yeah. trying to depict, but uh, that could be an interpretation that uh, you could make uh, with that, with the dress. Okay. Um, Mark, do you have a question? Mark Delancey? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I actually had a question slash comment about this same image because um, we can think about the the you know the pointing to Muslim identity as a thing of identity. I was thinking it could also be sort of a ringing of bells of sort of malevolence in the public mind. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking this is the time. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the U.S. is engaged in combat in the Mediterranean with the Barbary pirates and so on. So I'm wondering if there's a way to, to point out pirate, bad dude, uh, you know, a sort of set stock of motifs that signifies that. Hmm. Yeah, I think actually, Mark, you're really onto something. And I think I mentioned, uh, the, you know, the words Barbary pirate in, in some of my writing, but I, as I said, I feel like this is an image that I just have not given enough attention to and probably should have for, for today's talk, considering it is the kind of uh, indicator um, and it, it deserves more time um, in terms of the 1830s. And I think, you know, Jefferson's fights and uh, yes, and the beginnings of the American Navy and, and things like that. So thank you. Um. Fajila, um, have you had your hand up or no, no longer? Yes, hi, good afternoon. Salam Alaikum, Dr. Hankins. Um, I am a PhD student uh, studying in University of Glasgow and I write a lot about um, African identity and resistance in the former Danish West Indies, where I'm from, the Virgin Islands. And I'm also a Muslim. And um, I look at this depiction of Sinke and around his neck, the kind of pattern is what we call madras, mm -hmm. you know? And in the Virgin Islands, we call it madras. And this print is from India that was um, traded through the Bantu region up into West Africa and came to the Caribbean. And so a lot of times in the Caribbean, whether you're Muslim or not, you see a lot of people wearing madras. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you so much for your research. Thank you. This is what we're hoping from 
I think um, Zane and everyone all uh, in this particular edition is that there is more to be done. There's more about this story and these individuals that we can write about. And we're hoping that we've inspired others to take it and, and run with it. And so thank you so much for that. And so I'm welcome to you too. Wonderful. Any final questions? Um, we got a few minutes left. All right. If not, then let's go ahead and, and take our break right now. We got um, a, about a 10 minute break until the next session. So for, for just uh, and enjoy it. And I think it's best for <coughs> I think to the participants and, um, and, and for what you've brought and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs>
Uncle Tom's cabin. And we also know earlier portrait of unslaved black we have, the Whitbeard Peter of uh, 1863. Why is these images, whether written or portrait, were important for the abolitionists who were trying to mobilize the pre Civil War society to, to end slavery? But for unslavers and pro slavery, scholars, this was very important and very relevant. This is where we come up with Omar as our case study. Because they were, they were interested in the portrait of the unslaved for many reasons. One of them is the, domin the, the, the domination of the Southern Evangelical Society over the black slaves. This was extremely important to them. At the same time, also the argument that slavery was not a totally an evil. It was a la civilisation civilisatrice. It, it was a civilizing mission for the slaves. And it is a long list. So here I think we, we, we where Omar was very relevant to us. And in the piece, we argue that Omar was unique in his resilience. So we have to be careful when not to single out Muslims as a unique caste during slavery. That was the objectives of the unslavers, to make Muslim, a, African Muslim a different caste. That is not what we are arguing for. I think uh, Professor John Hope Franklin made it clear that resiliency was a part and future of, of unslaved black, regardless of time and place. But by uniqueness, we wanted to look, we look at Omar's writing and the hidden messages in Omar's writings that made Omar unique. And we cited Professor Paramore, who's the first African, uh, first American scholars to show interest in Omar, citing a document in 1904 published in the Observer in Wilmington that Omar was the most written about Negro except Booker T. Washington, which is very true. And some of our colleagues are still working on Omar and discovering more papers about him. So this is the case of Omar and his hidden message in his writings. The argument, the core argument we try to develop here is there is wonders and misunderstanding of Omar because Omar's message have never been deciphered and understood during his lifetime and after his lifetime. But well, that has to do with Omar's background, and in Omar's background, we argue theoretically, not in detail in this paper, that to understand unslaved Muslims or unslaved Africans, we need to understand three areas, literacy, orality, and education. So we did not go into detail in this paper to talk about it, but it is, it is the foundation of chapter one in, of our book. West African tradition is based first on orality. And we know from Hampate Ba telling us from his teacher that writing is not knowledge. Writing is just a form of knowledge. So there is, in oral tradition of West Africa, there is always a difference between wisdom and writing. These are two separate categories. So that's why in the, argue, in the article we try to draw on oral tradition, whether in Wall of al Pular, to showcase what Omar may have understood coming to America and how he may have understood the technique of dealing with subjugation. And the point number two in the necessary background to understand West African writings is literacy. By literacy we don't mean, we mean 
training in Ajemi writing in local languages and other ways of fostering wisdom. And the third category in understanding West African scholarship is Islamic education or school it Islamic, Islamic education. So this is extremely relevant in Omar's case because in Omar's autobiography he talks about spending 25 years seeking knowledge in Futa and Bundu. And when we decipher his writing, we find Omar citing scholars going back to 11th century, going back to 12th century, and going back to 13th century scholarship. And we're trying to look at what a particular message may have mean to Omar within his cultural background and within, within his Islamic training. So I'm try, I try here within five minutes to conceptually introduce how we think through the paper and develop it. So this is the background framework. And I hope in further questioning and discussion, I can elaborate more on some unique aspects of the paper. And thank you. So th thank you, Dr. Lowe. So Zane, if you don't mind, the way I look at it, um, and I think it's becoming clearer now. This uh, volume has a beginning, a framing, so to say, and it has the final piece. And Dr. Lowe's piece that he co-wrote with uh, with uh, Carl Ernst is the closing, and it's kind of telling that it ends with questions. But your piece fra frames it all. You are the force behind it. So um, I'm, I'm eager to hear from you. After you unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen and uh, let's see. Okay, actually, uh, let me see. I'm not pinned. Let me actually, um, sure, I'm pinned. Um, okay. Pin myself here and then share my screen. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Timor. And thank everyone for your wonderful presentations and engagement and exchange of ideas. Um, that was so illuminating for me and uh, so enjoyable. Um, what I want to talk about basically is, is the way in which uh, the Beshi Bazook as a painting, right, uh, was not of a real person, right? So it's the only article in the journal or the, the, the issue that was not about a real person. It was this figurative fig person who actually was a Muslim military uh, soldier of what's called the Irregular Army of the Ottoman Empire, right? And uh, let me actually just also, if I can, it looks like my, okay, there you go. All right, good. Yeah, so um, I just wanna begin the, in making this sort of um, intervention into the way we think about the painter and the sitter, uh, meaning the person being painted and the, per and the ones who actually are trying to portray blackness on canvas or uh, daguerreotype, whatever, sort of capture the image. What does it mean to capture black images? And, and so I wanna cite Frederick Douglass, as you can see here on the right, uh, this is a photo of him in 1879. And actually Frederick Douglass in the 19th century was, purported to be the most photographed individual, maybe outside of Lincoln, but definitely uh, among anyone who's African-American, but definitely he was, he was one of the most photographed persons um, of the 19th century. He really believed in the power of the photograph and what it could do in addressing all sorts of issues of recapturing uh, one's humanity, but also in telling uh, a social story 
about what's happening in our world uh, or what could happen, how we could sort of reframe, um, how we could stage a sense of, uh, of, of equality, right? He believed that, that you could stage that. Now, of course, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois felt in the same way, and he had uh, sort of his collection of photographs in uh, A Small Nation, his book called A Small Nation. Um, so in, in, in 1849, uh, Frederick Douglass, who was this, this amazing uh, African-American abolitionist, um, cited something in, he actually wrote a piece about portraits. Uh, and this was in, again, 1849. And it's so powerful, I just want to read the excerpt, right? Which I normally don't read a lot when it comes to uh, doing a PowerPoint. Um, Cause I'd like people to see the images and let's talk about the images. But um, the way he talked about the nature of the portrait as it relates to people of color uh, was this astounding. So I wanna read it here. It says Negroes can never have impartial portraits at the hands of white artists. It seems to us next to impossible for white men to take likenesses of black men without most grossly exaggerating their distinctive features. And the reason is obvious, he says. Artists, like all other white persons, have adopted a theory, he says, respecting the distinctive features of Negro physiognomy. We have heard many white persons say that Negroes look all alike and that they could not distinguish between the old and the young. They associate with the Negro face, high cheekbones, distended nostril, depressed nose, thick lips, and retreating forehead. This theory, he says, impressed strongly on the mind of the artist, exercises a powerful influence over his pencil and very naturally leads him to distort and exaggerate those particularities, even when they scarcely exist in the original. The temptation to make the, likely, the likeliness of the, or the likeness of the Negro rather than the man. Let me repeat that. The temptation to make the likeness of the Negro rather than the man is very strong and often leads the artist as well as the player to overstep the modesty of nature. So I wanna stop and pause and just think about those words and how we understood the power of the image. We're, we, we actually um, see it all the time with the news broadcast with all kinds of imagery. We're in an era of social media. The image is powerful and, uh, and instructive. Now, we also can see that all of our images that we're discussing today are of men and black men. This is why, one reason why I wanted to talk about this other image of Harriet Tubman, because again, she also posed in various ways but always you see her looking directly at the photographer, right? Her gaze is powerful and strong, uh, but she also uh, has, at least we believe she has this Islamic heritage because her, her given name was Araminta. Um, Araminta is, is from the, at least we believe from the Senegalese female name Right, that actually relates to Aminata. Now, which also, again, in, in Islamic naming is from the word Amina, which is the Prophet Muhammad's mother's name. So the fact that her given name was Araminta, which in, in Senegalese lore and, and female naming means Aminata, means that Harriet Tubman, this, this, this forceful female, powerful, abolitionist uh, perhaps had some Islamic background herself. We could say the same other scholars have talked about Frederick uh, Douglass, 
whose original last name was Bailey. And other certain historians argue that that last name Bailey is from Bilali, right? Which is an Islamic name from Bilal. But, uh, but scholars uh, like Michael Gomez argues that uh, the name Bilali was not a common white planter's name in the area where he was raised. So he couldn't have gotten that name, as the story goes, um, from some white planter. It was something that was unique to, uh, to him and, and to maybe his relatives. So um, I think what's interesting is looking at the photography, looking at the photographic image, it could portray some very important features uh, and attitudes. At the same time, the question is, what is it hiding? Right, hiding in plain sight. Do we know the story of these of these photos? And I think that's where it becomes very important, as as Rebecca Hankins and Laura, Laura and others have mentioned that that um, uh, there are certain silences here. There are certain sort of um, um, uh, sort of unspoken realities that actually um, are not sort of revealed. And so we have to also look at photos, not for what it says or what it tells us or the kind of visual culture that it has, but also for where it might lead us that we don't, in, in, in terms of directions that we are unfamiliar with, right? Um, and so I think that's uh, an important way of, of, of thinking about this. Now, for me, as I'm trying to wrap this up so we can start having a conversation, but uh, for me, um, the whole journal is really about uh, the visual culture of storytelling, right? So in a large way, how do, how do sort of these paintings um, uh, tell certain kinds of stories? How do the photographs uh, give us a certain powerful gaze? Um, and it could be for, for empowerment or it could be uh, for kind of conversations of, of, of sort of disempowerment. Right, so it can have this kind of duality to it, right? And so, uh, so I want to move on from this slide to the to the next. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay, good. Now, uh, the painter of the of the image that I'm discussing today, which is the Beshi Bazouk, is uh, uh, Jean Leon Giron, uh, who uh, was this French painter. This is a self portrait of him in 1886. Uh, but you can see on the other side of him, this framed picture in the Met Museum, which is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, um, that was painted, we think, between 1869 and uh, 1868 and 1869. Um, so what's interesting about, about Jerome is that he's not painting a real person. There's a model. Definitely, and we're, according to art historians, um, the the model is not known yet. Uh, there are some um, some ideas about who the model might have been, um, but uh, but he uses a model to create an image and a story, right about about <laughs> about Black Muslim imagery, right the visual culture of it all. Um, now, Jerome was this figure um, who was interested in what's called ethnographic painting, right? So he was this ethnographic painter. In other words, he's, he's coming up in an age of scientific exploration, and he's trying to sort of capture what he calls like an ethnic type, as it were, right? So some would argue that he was a realist painter. And in fact, I mean, he never considered himself that. In fact, he 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 appalled the the, the association of of trying to paint something that was sort of like a photograph would take a kind of realism. Um, he saw himself as a, a, as an ethnographer, as it were, as an as an anthropologist would 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 sort of uh, see himself or herself as as an ethnographer. In other words, one who is a witness. Uh, uh, or let's say an impartial, it's an important word, impartial witness of the Middle Eastern and African realities. Right? Um, now, that means something very particular, right, if you think about that. 
Um, but uh, but what's interesting though is that he was not looking for historical accuracy. He was looking to actually capture what is called this, this literary conceit, right? So a literary conceit is uh, basically is for trying to create a series of contrast, right? And so the photo here presents an irregular soldier in the Ottoman Empire called a Beshi Bazouk, um, but he was also trying to create a uh, uh, within this photograph, elegance, but also fierce militarism as well, right? The kind of duality that's there. And we could talk about that now. I don't want to give a full presentation on this, uh, but, but, but the dualities were important in the way in which he was trying to play with difference and, and, and similarity, right, in the, in the photography itself. Well, again, we can come back to that. Um, uh, but, but I wanted to, I want to make sure that we understand that, that, that this article, even though it, it appeared first in the journal, um, as, as Timur argued that perhaps it, sh it, it also reflects what's last in the journal. And for me, the reason why it might be something that's considered last in the journal uh, is, that, is the fact that um, it's not of a real person. It is the epitome of sort of artistic license, but, artistic license that actually speaks to the scientific age of how you create an ethnic type, right? So anyway, what I'll do is move to the next slide here, which is the one we're discussing, which is the Beshi Bazouk here. Um, and uh, the, Beshi, the Beshi Bazouk actually is a Turkish name, uh, meaning headless, right? We could talk about that. Why was he called headless? Especially in view of this huge sort of elongated sort of wrap around his, his, his fez, right? Uh, but there's a reason for that, we, we can discuss that. And of course, uh, this is juxtaposed with uh, Omar Ibn Said. So I'll, I'll stop my share so we can have a talk. All right, so I would like to invite again questions. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Zayn, one of the questions was already answered and there is another question for you to just clarify, which you can probably do uh, later by typing. But, um, or maybe you can do it now. So Elizabeth Brown is asking um, uh, who's the author and the title of the piece you're quoting. Uh, I, and she says that she thinks it's Frederick Douglass. Was it correct? That, that was a while ago. About painting. I think it was, well, it must be in your piece. So that's an invitation to um, access the journal and, and, and read your piece. Am I correct? Uh, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, again, let, so let's, um, before the questions light up, I'm sure they're about to light up, but I want to ask Dr. Law a question. Um, it's, um, huh, uh, and, and I, I, it will be kind of specific, but, but there is a more, it's tied to other things. So in your piece, you, uh, you just you you touch you indicate there is so much more there right it's it's all which is why it seems to me you may be um, ending with a number of questions uh, but one of the pieces that you bring up is is Omar bin Said's uh, letter from 1953 where you indicate some hidden transcripts those hidden transcripts are related to what you and Dr. Ernst call. Uh, uh, Said's um, eloquent resilience, eloquent being a key word. So it's resilience, yes, but the resilience has a style. It is his style of resilience, right? And in there, what struck me, it just, it's so obvious. Sometimes it's, it's nuanced, but here it's like, it's so obvious. He um, merely mentions <laughs> chapter 109 from the Quran. He just merely mentions it, <laughs> right? All right. What's I mean? Of course, it's famous. Of course, we know. <laughs> but yeah. can you say more about it? Well, thank you. Uh, sorry, I did not. Um, I learned from my training that once you wrote something, you expect your audience to have read it. 
<laughs> coming to your presentation. So I avoided repeating the content of our piece. You are right between eloquence and resilience. That is very West African. There is a saying in one of that means being silent is superior to speaking because he who speaks would be quali would be classified in a time of quagmire. So Omar, in that that is the origin of this title. The 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 eloquency is itself based in silence. Because from where Omar came from, in time of Kwakmai or Fitna, is better to be silent. Omar could not be silent because he was forced to write. If you look at the 1831 autobiography, there is a saying that to a gentleman called Hunter, who told him to write about his life, Omar told him, Sheikh Hunter, I cannot write about my life because I have forgotten my own language, let alone the Arabic language itself. Over the year, there were four translations of Omar's autobiography from Alexander Cohel in 1848 to Isaac Bird in 1860, to Professor Jemison in 1925, to most recently Professor Arise in 2011. In all cases, people misunderstood Omar's inability to express himself. I cannot write about my life. That itself is eloquency, is required from scholars in the Islamic tradition of West Africa to not to accept invitation to demonstrate their scholarship. You have to apologize that you cannot do it. I, Omar Said Abu Madian, one of the songs, poetry going back to 13th century that West African used to memorize. There is a line there asking them when invited to show knowledge, they should apologize. They should say they cannot do it. So what Omar has been doing over the years is to demonstrate culturalness, his, his training, his background, Islamic background, and West African orality, in which modesty itself is eloquency. So that is where this title came from when we said eloquency that is rooted in being silence. And to just relate my presentation to Zain's presentation, in ours we have three portraits of Omar, the three extant portraits of Omar. One is from Yale University, RAR book, and two from UNC. What is relevant is all Omar portraits were found with promoter, promoters of white supermist. Two of men Omar's portraits were found with Waddell and Ford. Waddell is the one who led the coup d'etat in Wilmington in 1889 to remove a black elected government, multicultural, multicultural, multi-political, multiracial government. And he went on up till 1920 to lead to lead this public monument that try to retell the, the stories, the tales of the lost to cause the Civil War. The second portrait is found with Ford, who wrote a book in 1877 about the merit of resending free black to West Africa. A second edition, 10 years later, in the third edition of 1904, he added a section on Omar ibn Said. It is, I always ask myself, why, what called for him to add a new section into this third edition of the book about Omar ibn Said? 
It is relevant because this is the time of the rise of black supremacists in the West, in the, in the South, and the rebirth of the KK movement as well, and so on, and the coming of President Woodrow Wilson a few years later. So Omar was relevant because Omar was a black intellectual who wrote about his life, and one of the key arguments of slavery, racism, and subjugation of black was black way illiterate. So it makes sense someone among black who wrote about his life while alive, while enslaved, that person should be reintroduced in different ways. So that is where the argument about Omar being the prince of Arabia came from. And there are more to the discussion, but I don't think we have enough time to uh, elaborate on it. But your question is in the right place. Thank you. Thank you, Zain. What do, uh, do you want? Do you want to add anything? Okay. Uh, no, I, I think uh, Professor Lowe actually uh, presented something very interesting. I'm looking forward to actually unpacking more of that uh, during the Q and A. All right. So again, uh, we invite questions. Uh, all, all one needs to do is raise a hand, and uh, and and that's that. The um, I, I see Carl Johnson has asked a question. Carl, would you like to speak? Was up? there any artist or photographer in the late nineteenth century that was able to present the African American image in an authentic way? Uh, did we have to wait to go Gordon Park or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> Is there anyone? You... That's a very good, it's a very good question. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Professor Lowe, you want to? Well, it, 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 it depends on what you, when you say African-American or the, un, the black image did exist from the Civil War onward. And all images are very telling. Uh, it was just a matter of interpretations. And one, uh, as I said earlier, there were three competing groups. One of this group were the free black. Not all black were enslaved, even in the pre in in in, in the antebellum era. I talk about thirty thousand. There were 30,000 free blacks in North Carolina prior to the Civil War. So you have a large segment of free blacks. And many of them also, people move back and forth between North and South. So there exists a lot of uh, images of, uh, of free and enslaved black during that time. But the image depends on, 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 it is on the eye of the beholder. All images, I think, are positive, and we can learn from each one of them yeah yeah no and I, I see someone mentioned this as well in the chat which is same thing i was going to uh, present is, is that in the work of deborah or deb deb willis deborah L willis um she does a lot of this work showing how black families uh, early on uh were photographed on their own and they were able to sort of change the narrative based on their their own sittings for uh, for certain kinds for for certain uh, photographs or portraits, um, there were also paintings, though not not many of, of certain black figures. Uh, but this was oftentimes done by white artists, as I read uh, in in the quote by Frederick Douglass, that that this oftentimes did not capture what the sitter would have liked uh, to portray. Um, but definitely, so photography begins. Uh, in France, but it also takes takes up um, uh, agency in the U.S. in the 1830s, right? Um, and, and so, by especially the uh, the daguerreotype uh, sort of ends within 30 years, and you move on to other kinds of type of, of capturing images. Um, but black people were were definitely uh, there at the very beginning. Uh, you have you had black uh, not only just photographers but black owners of Photography shops during these early periods, really, it was really amazing. And they they also uh, photographed white people as well, as well. you know. So um, so no, no the, so the image, or to say something that's more that that's um, more about black agency was captured 
early on and black people actually did participate in that and then tried to sort of structure uh, their, own, their own sense of themselves. All right, thank you both professors, I appreciate it. I, I didn't know that we owned our own uh, photography shops so or a pair, I didn't know that. I appreciate yeah. it, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Lowe, as well. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, I, I, I see Laura Laura places, uh, she's a black painter from Hartford, Connecticut, in the chat. She has a link uh, on Wikipedia, um, Charles Ethan uh, Porter. So yeah, that's this is, uh, yeah, it keeps the conversation going. Uh, resending the link. OK, someone else uh, send a link to. Um, uh, Timur, can you see the? Uh, yes, I can see. I would like to invite Dr. Gruber to um, ask her question about Bashi Bazook type. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Zane. This is Christian. This is uh, the second talk of yours that I've attended. I've been following <laughs> you lately. <laughs> so oh, thank, thank you. So much. you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, last time I asked you about the Nation of Islam, just uh, barely a month ago. Right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the Bashi Bozuk uh, type. I saw a little bit in your article and uh, there you mentioned sort of in passing also the Zabex, uh, the Zabek Lesh. So I wanted to hear more from you because I, I don't think you had sort of the space to elaborate in your, in your article and, and here uh, perhaps that, um, you know, we're, we're kind of quick to interpret these paintings with weaponry as uh, violent or prone to military operations. And of course, indeed, the Basha Bozuks uh, were irregular soldiers, but they're also related to the Zebekler and the FLA, these kinds of chivalric orders where the weapons are actually marks of status. And yes. uh, for someone like Jerome, that would be a romantic form of masculinity right. that could potentially be divorced from violence uh, despite the inclusion of armament. So I'm wondering, what you make of that sort of the the chivalrous male type rather than um our sort of urge to interpret the this weaponry as as violence no absolutely no thank you for that question absolutely i i think for for jerome i think he was trying to, in his painting he was trying to create drama and and he wanted to he of course was a fan of, of the theater uh, and he understood uh, drama and how it plays out theatrically and so he was trying to create that. And so the weapons allowed for, for that sort of duality of, of violence and sensuality coming together, right? Because you, you see in the Beshi Bazook painting, you see, of course, his, his I mean, his, his bulgy muscles that, that are underneath the, the pink garb, satin garb, but, but, but also the, there's a sense of grace there, but the weapons indicate some sense of, 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 of astuteness in terms of, uh, of, of, of military prowess, right? That's what, so you get these dualities there to create drama. Um, but I think you're right, historically, definitely, um, many of these, the, 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 the Beshi Bazook were mercenaries and they were called headless because they were believed to be without real leadership, right? They, 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 uh, they were known as fierce fighters. In fact, as mercenaries for governments, they were hired out. They were hired guns, as they call them, um, uh, in real life. But the reality is that uh, in European literature, including French literature and others, they try to paint them um, as, as, as murderous kind of individuals, people who just you know, had no sense of morality at all uh, and were fierce in that way. And so what happens, basically, is that other historians are raising the question because they were unpaid as irregular soldiers, they weren't paid. They actually are only paid uh, after after pillaging, right, uh, or, the, or the spoils of war. And so, oftentimes they had to pillage because even though they were supposed to be paid, they weren't paid. And this is how they survive. How they survive. So it's 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 like the the, the self fulfilling prophecy, right? You 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 sort of create. A situation where people have to fend for themselves, and then you call them brutal because you didn't pay them, right? And they have to, right? And so, and so these are gun, guns for hire. So, so certainly, uh, including weaponry in these in these kinds of scenes, because the Bashi Bazook, 
uh, Negre, the, the black Beshi Bazouk, uh, was not the only Beshi Bazouk that, that, that uh, Jerome painted. He painted other Arab looking type Beshi Bazouk. But what was fascinating about this one is that it allowed him to create a black Beshi Bazouk um, that uh, would, would play with, with a sense of Arabness, whiteness, right? Um, from, from sort of Europe, because the, these Beshi Bazouk came from Europe, parts of Africa. Um, they, they were part of, of course, Albania, the, 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 um, uh, the, all the part of the Ottoman Empire. But he also was playing with the idea that Greece, which was under the Ottoman Empire at the time, right? What was a white space, but also connected with Islam, connected with, with, with a Muslim identity, right? So he was always looking to sort of surprise the viewer, right? And, and, and sort of uh, keep the viewer off, off, off kilter, as, as it were. But I said, so I don't want to, we, we, can, we can definitely continue. I don't know if that answered your question, but I hope it did. Perhaps we can kind of uh, roll this discussion into our next uh, uh, session and call it an open forum. Because right. I, th I think there's something here because uh, uh, just structurally looking at the volume, your piece opens everything. Uh, Dr. Law's piece closes it and then asks questions. And I think part of Dr. Law's, um, if, you, if, if you don't mind, part of the kind of eloquence of your piece is that there are, there are some obvious notes that could be made there and you do not make them. And maybe because you just want us to buy your book or <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a preview, hopefully. Yeah. But, um, but what, so if we are to, and Nick, I think you are part of the closing session. So please, can you just join us? And everyone perhaps can join us. This would be our open session. Okay. So, um, so, 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 I'm sorry, Timur. Okay, could I? Yeah. So, before we move to the open session, I wonder if I could just just make mention of one thing that did not get in the journal for me um, because of deadlines. Of course, I mean, I had to cut a lot out. <laughs> it was really a lot, and we were over the deadlines uh, because, as an editor, I'm trying to shepherd everyone else's pieces through. Right, so it gets published and all that. So I'm the last one to submit my my piece. Um, but I think what I, something I found extremely fascinating to no end was the kind of a uh, yaragan, the, the 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 sort of um, uh, swords that many of the Bashi Bazook and others uh, held and wielded. Right, uh, these the, the these instruments of perfection. Right as it as it were the kind of metals that came together that produced them. But what's fascinating, and I was exploring this with with a Russian scholar. We were actually back and forth uh, in emails, right, about these swords, uh, and they were sort of experts in this thing, especially the the, the Russian uh, uh, ethnography museum uh, uh, down in Saint Petersburg. Um, but what was interesting is the Arabic writing of the Quran and and prayers on the swords. That was so, it was just so elegant and so beautiful, but it also uh, sort of heart, it also revealed that there was something larger than just Gwini land or something like that, there, right? Uh, that, that to have the Arabic and, and you could read, you know, um, sort of the Arabic that's there on these swords. And it's just mind blowing, right? The kinds of ways in which it's combining as, as, as Professor Lowe said, different kinds of um, ways of, of mixing language with Arabic type too. So, so, so there's, there's original Arabic there, but it's also this kind of, um, uh, 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 but what's the, the language we call the, um, the uh, first law, what was the, 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 the language of, you know, when, you, when, when you're saying something in English, but it's an Arabic type. Ah, I'm drawing a blank. Transliteration? Well, not not. No, no, no. This, this is the same. So, so like this is the same that that um, you all were talking about in, in the article uh, with with Omar Ibn Said trying to translate Omar Ibn Said. You can't just think this is a fully Arabic text. 
even though the writing might be in Arabic script. Right, right. Right. Let me see. Does anyone? Oh, uh, edge of me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I was drawing a blank. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. This, yeah, yeah. It, 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 this is the power of, of, of a larger exchange of people. Everyone, you know, sort of like we help the conversation to go on. So yeah. I just wanted to, to raise that as an issue that you, you find this kind of edge of me script, you know, uh, implanted there. And so it's not just a kind of Arabocentric kind of way of thinking about the world. People are actually sort of um, hybridizing and bringing in and re and, and representing questions in ways that, that actually cr create multiple universes and the ways we think about multiple cosmologies getting brought into the mix and all that. So I, I just wanted, before we went to, to the open forum, I just wanted to uh, bring in uh, uh, that, that, that yacht again, right? That actually was the sword that actually that was fantastic. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to put it in this volume, but hopefully in the future I can produce something. <laughs> it will be the commemorative 10th anniversary edition if of I, a special if, issue. If you may <laughs> allow me to just add a few points, I think uh, since you already mentioned the book, so I have to take this um, opportunity to <laughs> to promote and advocate for it. So uh, in the process of writing this piece, we really discover so many things about, not only about Omar, but about enslaved Muslims in America. And they're very telling. I think we do not know much about the life that they lived not because it does not exist, because maybe we don't have the training tools that are necessary to break through this area of knowledge. So you discover not Omar, only Omar was writing in Arabic, uh, Abdurrahman Ibrahim wrote in Arabic, uh, Sanasi who was in, I went to Panama a few months ago to look, he also was in the working in the Panama Canal and writing in Arabic. So you have many of them and we discover Omar exchanging letters with a Muslim in China. The, you know, if you go to the lab Library of Congress, the collections of Omar, you'll find some of it. So you, we, you really find so many good elements that really, with an interdisciplinary understanding of language, history, traditions, one can really have a clear understanding of how enslaved Muslim in the antebellum South lived their life. Americans also were very knowledgeable about Islam. It is not true that what we have been learning in the last few decades that they know little about Islam. They do. The U.S. was in contact. American soldiers fought for Muhammad Ali to conquer northern Sudan. American soldiers and prisoners were in, the, in, in North Africa and wrote novels that were bestsellers in the antebellum south. The U.S. engaged uh, to Turkey and uh, Morocco for international access to them. So, so many things. The U.S. was very aware of Islam and Muslim societies. And enslavers were aware of the fact that many of the enslaved Muslim, enslaved population were Muslims. But what they did were to argue that Muslims, enslaved Muslim black were not African, but they were Arab. So you, you, you discover just so much writing from uh, the, the Georgian enslaver uh, William Hudson writing that, you know, trying to convince the, the, the academic uh, community that the, the Fulbe are not no black, the Fulbe were Arab. So that is why by late following World War One, Omar was seen as Prince of Arabia and the first enslaved person to introduce Christianity to his native country of Arabia, as written by Timor. So you have so much rich materials about Muslims in the antebellum South, but we really need new types of training and language background in order to understand it. So in our upcoming book, we basically argue that we propose instead to, 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 to restore the Islamic and West African 
the meanings of Omar's text in a way that illuminate contemporary American debates on racism and also consider Arabic as one of America's literary languages. So that is basically the book, hopefully, will come out sometimes uh, next year. It is still under review. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So Zane, would you like us to start the open session? Absolutely, yes. So the open session, what it is, it's an invitation for everyone in our group and our amazing group of uh, friends, colleagues, those we know and do not know yet, uh, to you know, raise their hands, uh, you can turn on your cameras and we can have an exchange and we can have uh, questions. There was a question that was asked earlier, I will, I will, re I will resurrect it. But uh, before that, Zane, so one of the things that, and I think that's where we're going, uh, one of the discussions uh, we had, you and Nick and I, um, while we were working before and while we were working on this volume and while you were working with, uh, with all the wonderful authors, contributors, was um, wh why do this, right? Who will read it, right? Uh, it is uh, the way it is produced, we made sure that it looks different from all the issues that have been published by the Muslim world in, over the hundred some years, right? Um, we made sure that it's printed. Uh, so thank God, you know, we still can print journals on paper so you can actually hold it. So you can actually meditate on an, on a, on a, on a, uh, on an image and, um, and, um, on, on the process of authenticity, for example, right? So uh, being authentic is a process, it's not a given, right? So it's, it's a dialogical kind of process. And so, um, so all of that. But meanwhile, so Zane, and we were talking about how would, be, how would it be used in a classroom? And it's almost like a, a, a strange idea to, for, for a whole issue of a journal to be used in a classroom. <laughs> it was our kind of the wildest ambition. And, uh, and of course, whatever is possible is possible, but perhaps we can have a, at least some of the reflections on how, how could this be used in a classroom or the, the meditations, the engagements that, that are similar to this, right? Yeah, I think, I think perhaps we should unpin ourselves so we can open it up a little bit too. Um, you, you wanna do that, Timur? I do not know how to do it. Okay, you just uh, go to the, let's see, I'll do it. You hover over it, you remove the pin here. Let me see, I'll remove my pin. Oh, okay, Julie did it, okay, good. Uh, for some reason, I'm still, I'm still pinned. Let me do my, uh, I used, okay, I can remove your pin too. All right, so let me go back to gallery. Okay, good. Yeah, so again, as, as you said, you know, this is, this should be an open forum, right? It should be just those of us who want to just, you know, kind of raise, raise questions. We had, I think, a wonderful um, a, a program today. I, I loved your, everyone's participation. Uh, the audience questions uh, is, is I, I feel fortunate. You mentioned to more that you feel privileged and fortunate. I am looking at you all so brilliantly Kind of giving all kinds of commentary, and I just feel so fortunate myself and privileged uh, to be in this space. Uh, so, what's interesting is is um, at the end of my article for the journal, I mentioned uh, Jim and Jim Johnston's uh, presence in in London, right, and how he's there with with young people, the youth right, around some of these paintings, right? And so I was looking at, I think, Jim, was was, was that the, 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 the uh, Ayuba? Yes. The, yeah, the Ayuba painting. Um, and, and so something else that I mentioned when I talked about Jim was that um, when, when you think about these figures, yeah, there it is, good. <laughs> uh, when you think about these figures, I mean, you can't help but really just admire the kind of dignity that they maintain in the face of such horrific and institutionalized racism and, and white supremacy. I mean, it's a whole, an entire country that is trying to maintain your subject, your, your, your subjugation, right? Um, I, that, 
That is just no small feat. Um, and it wasn't that necessarily this, you know, the way we read, see, I want to be careful that we don't read back on that period um, notions of blackness the way we think about them today, right? So I, I don't think, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think that, you know, Yarrow or others, right, are thinking about blackness in that same kind of way. But I think they were thinking more about what you would say to more, their humanity, right? And, and what that means to be dignified and what that means to be even, right? This is, these are areas when progress is the big, is the big thing. Right? How, how do we sort of uh, become progressive human beings in our lives and, and make our families proud? And maybe the, the, our children yet unborn, how do we pass on legacy and lineage, right? You know, and so I think those basic human things that people want. Um, I just wanna say that, that one thing that, that I have three more, I think three more slides my presentation that I want to I want to do something that that uh, that Laura did right and basically is is how does this relate to today, right? How do we show how portraiture, right, works today for for truth telling, right? And so if I if I can still share my screen, I'll just do this quickly and see how. Okay, let me see. So this is actually oh okay. So, so what's interesting here is, is that, let me just put this, you all on, uh, okay. Go back to your, i navigate the thing here, okay. All right, so, so um, I, I just wanted to, to introduce this image here, right? Because these are portraits, right? And, and, they're, and they're in the public realm and they're part of this whole George Floyd portrait of a portraiture as a way to sort of remind the public of all sorts of things, of course, uh, about humanity, but also about struggle, about um, dignity. And I, I don't think it's so, so unfamiliar with the kind of portraits we're talking about right now, right? So it has the same sort of import that, that's really powerful and important. And people are still using that form of visual culture as a way to talk about and redress these kinds of issues. And so children should know that there's a connection, right? We should teach this in the classroom. What is the connection, right? Between portraiture in, this, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries and what it looks like today and how it's being used. Now, the other part of this is here, this portraiture and Black Lives Matter. This is in Baltimore where young people are doing similar things, right? And so you, you find them painting on walls, you know, the, the human face, what does it mean to sort of plaster the human face on a wall, on a, on, on a building, um, on all the sorts of other places, right? You can see I've, I've tried to sort of create this collage, as it were. Um, here you have Muslims who are also part of that, that project in Baltimore, right? The Black Muslim Portraiture Today. So, so they had also Black Muslims who actually lended their, their, their image, right, to, to the same kind of thing of, of the gaze, how do you look back at the society that's actually uh, has has subjugated you to certain kinds of uh, 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 oppressions? So, and I think this is the last one: the portraiture, uh, the portraiture as the corporate. And th this is an Airbnb, right? I was surprised when I came across this. This is something I wanted. To, I wanted to actually add this part in my article too. I didn't get a chance, but but you can see how again, um, you can see in this image. Uh, to well, both right to to the right, the top right there, uh, where the walls going around. This is at Airbnb headquarters, where you see you know the images going around, but they're all like portraits, you know, half size portraits, uh, going around, and they're holding, of course, a message. Right on the left side, um, you see it all around on every floor, right, and you see them small pictures, larger pictures, and then in the bottom left. Uh, you see uh, the, the these young employees who are who are creating this, and it's all about you know using uh, the, the the portraiture to do it. So um, I I don't so I, I don't think what I want to say is I, I I think that um let me just go back to full screen, okay. Um so uh, 
it's in the classroom, but we also teach in the public too, right? And, and, and I think we need to do both. We can't just um, think that is this all just di didactic, didactic um, for like classroom like learning. I, I, I think that that um, uh, this needs to happen in different different kinds of spaces. And people are using the face as a way to sort of confront racism and that sort of thing. There's a, I'll say this last one thing. There's a gentleman who actually is from France and he uses the pseudonym. Um, he goes around the world and just it just it just creates portraiture. Just he he went to the, the, the was the San Quentin prison, I think it was. And he has a wonderful TED talk, right? Where he goes, and I'll maybe I'll try to try to find it and post it, but but he goes around the world, he went to the prison and actually created a, a, a collage of the inmates' portraits that changed their lives behind the walls. Right? He went to Brazil and did the same thing. So anyway. I'll be quiet and listen. <laughs> Thank you. So questions, comments. Can I can I add to Zain's wonderful rendering? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I um, I am a little bit uh, uh, reluctant to embrace portraiture imagery representation as means of communication or as the correct truth mean of communication because it is just it is sentimentalism and, and we talk about sentimentalism is the language of the oppressor so it simplifies the truth the story there is a saying in sufi that tell me the haqiqa tell me the truth uh, don't summarize it so one of the strengths of the West Africans, the enslaved, the, the uh, uh, black Americans is the power to tell a story, the storytelling power, the Negro spiritual. And that may be lost if we focus on image and imagery, because in a way, sentimentalism historically means about feeling. So it's more of focusing on feeling rather than focusing on reasons. So I will just give you the image that the image is telling you the story. We need to ask the story. We need to find the story behind the image. Otherwise, this imagery is the tool for the oppressor, for those who have power to manipulate us. So this is true historically, that's why in our piece, we don't just stop at the imagery of Omar. We went and look at what Omar wrote in 1853 at the same time when his image was taken. We tell that writing tells us the story rather than depending on the representation of Omar to tell us the story. So that is truth then and now. We still need to find stories behind each image behind each portrait, behind each event that whether it, it is in the state or overseas. So I just wanted to add this to uh, Professor you know, Zain Abdullah's point, which is very convincing, but we need the full image here. Thank you. Uh, 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 Dr. Hazel Lin, can you speak? You have your hand up. There I am. Sorry, muted myself. Um, well, Zane, Professor Lowe, I'm. I was absolutely love what you've just been talking about, and I think, in some ways, I don't know if I, if I'm going to be able to add a huge amount. Um, I love the prov provocation you set out for us, Zane, about how does portraiture relate to truth telling? Because I think, in some ways, that to me summarizes all the discussions of today of what we do with these artifacts, these, these, these portrait artifacts. Um, and I think, as Professor Lowe says, we really need to, we have to build all this context, context around them. And I think that, that, that you know this whole project, this whole journal project, and then this conference is demonstrating the depth of, um, of historical research, both pictorial and contextual that needs to go in to actually tell 
to tell more truthful stories about these portraits and that they can't, that they can trick you as well. You know, like the, the image that's on the front of the journal, you might believe that's of a specific person that is representative of a figure, yet instead, what we then realize is there's a much more complex and fascinating picture about ethnographic approaches to portraiture that has kind of, um, that is all kind of tied up in that. I guess just reflecting on my own time of, as I was teaching and curating portraiture, I think there's a, a few things that I think are particularly tricky to really um, get across to people. I think that idea that portraiture was a real exceptionalism until the advent of the, the photograph. You know, so the painted portrait is something that was an, you know, a once in a lifetime experience for a very small group of people that they would have been represented. Um, and I think that that idea that then a portrait is made at a very specific time, as Professor Lowe says, means that we... Day to graph a few seconds in a person's life. And I think that that, for me, is a really important thing for us to kind of keep coming back to. Um, however, I think as a curator, what I often find is, is the frustration that we want to have more images that represent our audiences now, because I agree with you, Zane, I think that this portraiture is, is incredibly important at the moment, and it's one of the most direct ways we can talk to people and to say that your history is being told in public spaces, um, and I think that that's you know, and then you, when you're faced with the fact that, for example, there's, you know, we have one, we had one print of Oladar Equiano um, in the National Portrait Gallery's collection. And for its conservation, we could only have it on show for one year out of 10. What do you then do with that image, which everybody wants? And not only just the people at the National Portrait Gallery, but galleries and museums are requesting it from across the UK because it's such a rare print. And so I think that there's something there's something that we've got to do with our working with contemporary artists, working with scholars, but how do you keep, um, you know, how do we keep these things in circulation? Um, so yeah, that was just my, my sort of slightly random reflections on what you were both saying, but um, yeah, it's really fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Sagerman, you were first, Zane, is that okay? If, um... Oh, no, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hello, uh, my name is Alex Segerman. I'm from Rutgers, uh, and thank you so much for the volume and these great talks today. I've been um, taking lots of notes and learning so much. So, you know, in terms of amount of portraits that we have of Black Muslims in the 18th and 19th century versus the portraits we have of white Americans, you know, we're talking about hundreds if not thousands of portraits of um, white people versus these handful of um, really compelling portraits. But I'm wondering, you know, how do we tell a history or an art history with such a small amount um, of images and people? And uh, can we extrapolate from this group um, to form a larger history of these people? Or are we, or are these sort of very exceptional cases that should be only taken as representative of these individuals? For instance, there are no women in this group. Um, where were the women? Can we use these pictures to tell a story about women too? Do we think that those images are out there? Or, or should, like, how is how much is this representative of a larger group of people? We can use these to tell a larger history, or do we just need to focus on these portraits in particular and these store these people? So, you know, it's like how what's the bigger community that is being represented and how how much can we build out a history based on these fascinating images? Thank you. So I, I see Dr. Zay, uh, Zane, you were first, then then Dr. Turner, then Jim Johnston. Yeah. Um, no, thank you all for for those comments and thank you uh, Dr. Lowe uh, for, for your position on that. I, th uh, I think it's really interesting that um, we can't really think about it as an either or situation. 
either images or not images, right? Um, visual culture is a language, right? And so if we can't afford to silence or background any language, right? Because it tells a, lang a story that oftentimes language cannot capture, right? And so I think that's the whole point about imagery uh, is, is, is that it's, it's kind of, it's, um, it allows the symbolism itself, sometimes a symbol could be more important than a whole book, right? Uh, as, as the story goes, right? Uh, a picture is worth more than a thousand word, words. But, 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 but the point here is, is that um, uh, our society oftentimes, especially in, the, in this mediated age, is all about the image, is about and what that image says. But I think though, that it gives us an opportunity to engage on a different level. For instance, some would say, oh, mythology is just fictitious nonsense, right? But the reality of, of, of the way Plato talked about mythology, right? And, and, and creating the royal we and, and, and all that, I mean, it creates something in the society that's very powerful. And so mythology like imagery is, 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 is connotative, meaning that it's multi-layered and multi-dimensional as opposed to, um, let's say, maybe some words, maybe not all, um, are denotative. They, 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 it's, it's a one level kind of engagement. So, so mythology is, because mythology and imagery is about the imagination, right? And so this harkens back to people like uh, uh, Einstein, who said imagination is more important than knowledge. And I think that's important because with, with, with information, with knowledge, you have data. But imagination, you have, uh, you have vision. And it's, so, so it's a very different way of thinking about communication. So basically, I'll just end here by saying that um, it's not either or. It's, it's actually a context about what kind of conversations you want to have. Visual culture gives us certain kinds of conversations. Um, discourse around, around ideas, be it his, uh, a sort of intellectual history or, or, or what have you, that's, that's, a, that's, a different other, that's another kind of conversation. And we need all kinds of discourses. So we'll end it. Thank you, D uh, Dr. Turner. Yes, you know, I, I like very much Dr. Lowe's analysis because I, I th um, what I'm getting out of this, and I can put it in the context of the study of African American religions, is that um, you know visual culture is extremely important. But you know, in our studies of um, you know religions of marginalized groups in the United States, I think that we have to take hold of the study of popular culture. Because when we um, look at the, the visual images in the context of popular culture, um, we're also taking into account um, orality, um, you know, written, um, you know, um, let, uh, written culture, cultural reactions to the images by those people who have um, you know, who have been commodified by images. We are, um, you know, today, if, if we're looking at the images, we also have to look at digital culture. And I think increasingly um, in, the, in the modern world, um, in terms of issues of human rights and, um, you know, um, political agency and the ways that images of, um, of marginalized groups are mediated, um, we do have to um, very much intervene in popular, in popular culture because our whole political order in, the, um, you know, in this country today and perhaps democracy is is being reshaped by um, extremism, um, by people who have mastered aspects of, of, of popular culture through Twitter and through Facebook and have, um, you know, um, circulated all kinds of misinformation that millions of Americans actually believe about, um, you know, about 
politics and democracy that, um, you know, perhaps is um, falling into the into the into the garbage pail of fascism in this country. So, so I once again I very much like um, Dr. Lowe's comments about um, analyzing the image um, images of people of African descent in the United States in these in these larger uh, contexts. And for me, popular culture is extremely important. All right. So, uh, 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 Mr. Johnston. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The, um, with Yara Mahmoud, uh, I spent eight years researching him. And then uh, in 2015, I got the city of District of Columbia to do archaeology on his lot. So we're bringing that was bringing in a second discipline. Uh, Dr. Segerman uh, asked about women in art. Turns out that uh, James Alexander Simpson did paint uh, a woman, Jenny Sarah, who came obviously apparently from Africa. It was a companion painting to his portrait of uh, Yara Mamut, but that painting got lost, and I assume because someone thought it was unimportant. But so we have archaeology, we have history, sort of biography, and then yesterday Carol and I were talking about it, and Carol started looking at the portrait, the Peel portrait, and coming up with all these other things about Yara Mahmoud just from the portraiture. So I think that this interdisciplinary approach, that all of them are important, and we want to reconstruct what our history was. And I think, as we're all saying, it was an integrated history. All right. Any, any other comments? I mean, this is strong notes. Um, yes. Um, uh, Dr. Hidri, here with you. Yes, thanks very much. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes, thank you. I've had a great morning and afternoon and I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to diving into this volume which I'm intending now to use in a course that I teach at York University in Toronto, um, which is called um, Images of Resistance, Irresistible Images. And I think that um, the reason why I titled it that was because I think a lot of my students, um, we are one of the largest universities, public universities in Canada, and um, the vast majority of our students are first, second generation Canadians. Um, who come from, we speak 87 languages on campus as first languages. Um, what's remarkable is many of the students who take the course um, come from backgrounds which are, are non-European in origin. I think what's, what's remarkable about this, uh, this volume, um, and many of them are Muslim, many of them are Black, South Asian, self-identified. I think what's really remarkable about this um, this this set of papers and um, and, and presentations is um, many of my Muslim students and my Black and South Asian Muslim students says we do not see images of ourselves in classes, we do not we do not have um, pictures of ourselves, and I always uh, sort of quote then what Edward Said quoted with Antonio Gramsci about you know the idea that history has locked all sorts of traces in us. But there's no inventory. There's no guide to this. And I think that what I try to emphasize, and I think this volume will really help, is trying to kind of, first of all, challenge the invent received inventory that many of these students have, um, which is in, in contemporary terms and historical terms and art, art history museums and galleries, a very truncated, very narrow, and sometimes very violent um, misreading of histories. Um, so I think that these images do tell stories and the question is who is going to tell them. And so I think that these inventories that we create, and I've heard a number of different stories, we've, you know, I'm using the term story as another, as inventory as another term for story. I think one of the issues is perhaps there's not one story to tell here the authentic, the real, but many there are multiple ways of getting at these images. And I think that what's really uh, the crisis for, for, these, for these students who I teach is that 
the stories that they're being told, even about the, using these images, um, are uh, perhaps not um, well researched, not really thought through, not really considered in any systematic way, but used to kind of um, on both sides, the idea of, you know, people using them to say, oh, you know, uh, South Asians were there first, Muslims were there first, you know, that kind of story, which maybe has some merit. And then the other side, which is Muslims are violent, you know, uh, black communities um, are, you know, have been perpetually impoverished because of their own accord, all these misreadings of history. And so I think the tension for me here is, um, as a teaching volume, this provides great opportunity, but it can also go the other way um, without a proper sort of um, framing, situating, um, and grappling with this with this critical issue of how maybe there's not one story here, but there are the many 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 inventories are being created with this material. And so I, I think this has been the biggest challenge for me listening today is how do I get, what are the tools required? What, is, what are the hermeneutic tools required to uh, provide interpretations, readings, critical understandings that allow people to work with these images from where they're coming from, where they're at and where they want to go? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think your comments are are wonderful, and um, I was going to, to also say that images are extremely important, but we have to be very careful how we use them, which is exactly what you're speaking to, I think. And of course, the first thing that people have to do with an image is to make sure they do their due diligence, that they do deep research. And even when people do deep research, people can differ in their opinions of how they read the pictures. So um, it's, it is problematic. I don't think it's in a way ever going to become unproblematic because perhaps images don't sit still totally and, and they give off different affects to different people or people see certain things differently or another fact appears. So I think we use them as an incredibly enriching source with information to the degree that we can use it at that moment. And it may evolve. Some of these images, just like more research, can somehow blossom out and be more than that. But it's it's difficult. You can't, I mean, you have an image and you, you're going to put words to it, right? So you're dealing with two different media right there. Uh, and you can fall in, in a hole uh, there. I, I also wanted to mention that the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts just in the last couple of days purchased at auction an amazing portrait of a black woman. Uh, it's Creole and she has a headscarf on, you know, so she looks very Southern and very Creole. And um, I don't know that anything is really known about the history of this image, but of course it was a great coup for Virginia to get this picture. I think it was just under a million dollars, simple portrait of a woman. Uh, we, I don't think we know who the artist is or any of that. So there's an, there's an image, there's what are we gonna do with it? What will happen to that image over time? What will we be able to find out about it or not? How will people, what will people project upon the image? And of course, people are always projecting upon the image with portraiture for example, because we are human and we are relating to them to some degree as we relate to other human beings, uh, positively, negatively, whatever. So that's just my two cents. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, Dr. Turner, Minlib, Dahl, and then we'll see how it goes. So the positive aspect of us keeping the break is that, hey, we just added a few extra minutes to this very delightful conversation. Uh, at the same time, by adding a few minutes, we are extending the stress on our bodies, so we have to be careful. So, so, um, um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, Zain, you will have the last word, but, uh, and then I will have maybe the para penultimate word. Uh, but Dr. Turner. Yes, going back to the very important issue of, uh, of, of 
Muslim women of African descent enslaved in the United States. We cannot, um, you know, um, uh, uh, look at um, the, you know, Islam in, in, in this um, important era of, of, of US history completely through the lens of European and European uh, American men who, because of their patriarchy that interacted with anti-Black racism, chose to only take portraits of, um, you know, of Muslim, of, of, of Muslim men who were enslaved. So I think it's very important, once again, to contextualize these um, images of enslaved Muslim men in the, uh, in, in the U.S. in conversation with um, rich source materials that certainly is available about Muslim women um, who were enslaved in this era, particularly on the South Carolina and, and Georgia Sea Islands, because we do know that probably the, um, you know, the last um, Muslim uh, um, um, person from, from this era uh, that we have historical documentation on um, after the Civil War was a, um, a Muslim woman somewhere on the South Carolina or Georgia Sea Islands who uh, uh, apparently was um, beginning to go into the, um, you know, into, I, I forgot what you call them, the prayer houses at the that were in the uh, Gullah community after, after the Civil War. So I think that this is a, another um, way that I will go back to some of Dr. Lowe's comments. And, you know, it might be very interesting to have a, an issue on um, Muslim women uh, enslaved in the US. Um, in, in conversation with these um, these these um, images that are, are dominated completely by men. Yeah, I, I know. I just want before we go to, to Delhi, um, uh, um, uh, Denise Spielberg is actually working on a book that looks at enslaved African Muslim women, um, and she's been working on that for quite some time. Uh, and so, so this speaks to your your point, uh, Richard. Yeah, because the documentation is out there with uh, Mike Michael Gomez's um, research and with Sylvian Dioff's research and um, with the Works Progress Administration um, interviews with um, you know uh, descendants of, of of Muslim slaves on the South Carolina and Georgia Sea Islands who, who recall their you know, stories of their ancestors who were Muslim women who were, you know, uh, wearing hijab and praying at specific times of the, the you know, uh, the day and, and um, circulating rice cakes during, um, during, during Ramadan. And uh, so the evidence is out there. Min, Min Lib. Hey, hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Lowe, really. Um, we happen to share the same part of the world and be all former colonial French. So um, <laughs> I want you to react on the dialectic. You talk about the representation uh, at the beginning of your talk and I'm interested in the representation, the dialectic between the representation of black bodies and the imagination or conceptualization of the divine. Right? It seems though that in so many ways, it has always been the conceptualization of the divine has always been taught and been other, fundamentally other than what blackness can be. So that was my question. Can, 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 you, can you elaborate more? Sorry. Oh, uh, in the sense, I mean, you were talking about, you know, um, uh, portrait or representation of faces and so on are largely dominated by uh, those in charge, those who, you know, talk about sentimentalism. But I want to, what I'm, I'm getting at is when you go to African churches or all those places, 
the divine is always represented at the most other to those who are sitting in that house. And you get all those portraits of Jesus and Mary and all that. None of them look like a single person sitting in that house. <laughs> Even today. So that's that's what I'm, I'm I'm getting at because you know the way we imagine and conceptualize the divine, at least in my view, has a lot to do with that those who count or do not count, right? So I don't know. I mean, you can just take the example of Senegal if you want to, uh, right. and just see uh, in your own um, research and so on how the conceptualization of the divine. I know that you can represent the divine in Islam like we do in Christianity, but at least how they imagine the divine, in which way black bodies participate in that business, in the business of the divine. Right. Yeah. yeah. Your, your, your question is very powerful. Um, I may not necessarily align with uh, my uh, reflection to uh, Professor Abdullah's point. I was basically just wanted us to think about, remember Walter Benjamin's argument in the arts, art in the, in the age of mechanical reproduction. There, there are some points that he made about what is lost when the story is told, is imagined, is, 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 it becomes an artistic work. There is something missing there. So it, it's just a piece that we all need to go back and read. Waterman, I mean, one of, yeah. So that's what I'm arguing here. Add to that that we of African background because image is continuation of the argument about writing forming as the representative of the truth. Remember Karl Marx's argument that Africa has no chapter in the book of history. His argument was because Africa didn't write it. So when I said earlier on that one of the points made by the sheikh to Ba was writing is something and the truth is something else. I mean, rep representation should not always be, that visual representation doesn't always reflect the truth. In the African wisdom, the two are separate. That why his sheikh was telling him the truth is something, but the visualized representation of the truth is something else. So remember uh, one of how we African lost earlier with the colonial, you find this in, in the writing of the founding fathers, early on European, they will come in South Africa and they will come with a contract that we're going to purchase this land. But for African, the land, you can't sell it, they, but you can't prevent people if they want to use it. So you have two understanding of the truth here. What is written is the truth, but the truth is a separate entity. So what I'm saying also, we should bring that when as we deal with representation, visual image in for African, because it is a very tiny part of our story that we have to tell. So I'm not dismissing, I agree with Zain, it is not this or that, but it is always important to remind us that they are, and Yahiz was a towering Arabic literary scholar. In the ninth century, when Arabs were dismissing the very civilization of black, he told them the same thing. He told them, no, you are judging based on what you see. To know the truth, and he wrote this in Fadlu Sudan al Baydan, you, you have to learn, you have to find the story of this black. Only then can you tell the truth. And, and the final point, I think you make very, 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 very succinct about the divine. But in Islam also, some sec sectors in Islam, they do represent the divine. The Shiite, they do, and others do. But I think your point is very, very important. It is just a different story that I think we can communicate and talk about it more. Thank you. All right, so as, as I'm looking at the clock, it reminds me of, uh, what's that song by um, um, Sam Cooke? all night long, let the good times roll. Um, it's unfortunately we cannot do that. So um, so we have to 
we, we're going to have to walk work towards um, saying goodbyes. But let me just say, um, I uh, this exchange reminds me of a line from Dr. Law's article, which he co-wrote with um, Dr. Carl Ernst. Um, it's in the beginning of a section. Um, it goes, some, some self-reflection may help us better understand Sayyid's silent yet eloquent resist, resilience. So the first kind of step is self-reflection is part of it. And um, so as I was, as I was listening, um, I was, uh, the, the question that kept coming to my mind was not just teach, but how to teach and where does it start, right? So that, that process of self-reflection which reminds me that um, um, what 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 the authors in this piece in this volume do, let me just straight up say it: they do not interrogate their material. <laughs> There's that word, nasty word out there. They're going to interrogate the material. Nope, they're not. They are engaging and relating with the human beings. It somehow, whose lives are somehow in there, through there. Not in there, but through there. There is a smell, the taste, the presence, somehow in there. It's not in the portrait, it, but it's some. It's so that so this engagement, this agonistic engagement, and with the word uh, engagement, it reminds me that the proper engagement is a respectful engagement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it begins with the respect, not as something to arrive at, not something to teach. But as a precondition, you begin with respecting the human being whom you do not know. <laughs> the human being behind that portrait. You just do not know them, right? And, but you, it begins with the respect and the engagement deepens the respect. And in the, spi in the spirit of respect, I would like to um, invite, hey, Nick, you're back. And because you're human and you take care of your children. So do you want to have the word before Zane has the final word? I, I, I apologize. I, yeah, I was off, I was off with my kids. I don't have much to say other than um, I, I thank you for the conversation, and then uh, we'll we'll allow Zane to have the final word. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> no, I just want to end by thanking everyone for the discourse, the exchange of ideas. Um, any conversation about art, definitely is an ongoing one, right? As what Carol said as well. Um, and, and this is, I think this is the value of producing a piece like this is that it allows us to actually discuss ideas, exchange thought, um, get feedback, insight. Um, but it's not, it's definitely not something that um, is, is a discussion that, that sort of will be settled. This is, this is not something to be settled is something that is ongoing. Um, and I think that's an indication of, of real knowledge. Um, du Bois talked about art. He says, he says, I don't give a damn about art except as propaganda, right? So Du Bois was really succinctly involved in the production of art and what it meant, right? And I think that was a powerful way of thinking about it. The other part is that what, what Dr. Lowe was working on too was interesting in terms of Omar, Omar Ibn Said's letter, something we didn't talk about um, is that in that letter, he's, he, he's writing art, right? He's drawing art. There's, there's a geometric pattern. Like, why is that there, right? I mean, when I think about that piece, I don't think it more, I know, I know Dr. Lowe has suggested that it might be a talisman. Um, I have a different view of that, right? And, and but because when you look at the geometric, geometric patterns, it actually speaks to something I think larger that relates to resistance and the way of thinking about the cosmos, right? Because it's like the way it is structured, there are sort of unending structures that they, they can be repeated and repeated and repeated, right? Right. So more about that later, but but I think that um, it, it shows up in all sorts of ways. I think something we didn't talk about is the way art is, is a Western concept. It's a Western construct is in and of itself, this notion of art that you can pull out of, of, of human creativity, something that we can 
call art, right? We have to, some, that's something we have to unpack, right? And other, as Dr. Lowe said, other parts of the world, they don't, they don't consider these artifacts art. They, 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 they have utilitarian purpose, right? Um, but the West takes it and puts it in, in a museum. Right? Now it's art, right? So we have to talk about, like, so I, I just think that this is a, an ongoing, rich, you know, valued conversation um, that, that I look forward to us coming together again and, and continuing it and, and bring more people into the discourse. So thank you all so very much for your time, for your feedback, your energy. Uh, I'm humbled by that. And I look forward to seeing us, uh, see you all again it's very soon. Thank you.